could be joining us. She didn't indicate uh, any troubles, okay. but I'll send her a quick one. Okay, well, why don't we get going? Um, good evening and welcome to the Monday, February 8th, 2021. There's Penny, hi Penny, uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, we're gonna start with the roll call, please, Deb. Chairman Garvin. Here. Councilor Boucher. Here. Councilor Devereaux. Here. Councilor Gabrielson. Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Here. Councilor Noonan. Here. Mr. Chairman, you do have a quorum. Thanks very much, Deb. Uh, could you all please join me in pledging allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we've got a pretty full house filing in tonight. Uh, I've got about 40 people uh, in the attendee gallery at the moment. Just uh, note that for the record. Um, we'll start off with any uh, town council reports or correspondence. Is there anything that anybody um, has to report on to start? Jeremy? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just I wanted to report I had a correspondence recently from the board of the Cottage Brook Condominium Association. Um, with the uh, recent completion of Astor Way, they've requested that the council take a look back at the gate on, I believe it's Chicory Way is the little connector road in there. Um, so I wanted to um, mention that correspondence and um, see if we could put that item on an upcoming workshop or council meeting for some further discussion. I know there's been a lot of discussion around this previously, um, but wanted to be responsive to the request. But Mr. Chairman, you're on, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, we'll get that scheduled. I think starting with a workshop probably sounds like the first place to go on that. So we'll look for a spot on the calendar for that. Thanks for that. Uh, any other counselors with any reports or correspondence they want to bring forward? OK. Um, then, Council Gaberson, why don't we go back over to you for the report of the Finance Committee? Great. Um, yeah, thank you. So we're um, getting ready to come up on budget season. Um, I, I see we've got an agenda item on that a little bit later on in the uh, tonight's agenda. Um, as we're just looking back through monthly numbers, um, expenses are continuing to track well. Uh, we've continued to the recent snowstorm not having shown up on our books yet um, to track a little bit ahead of where we thought we would be in terms of salt and, and uh, overtime. Um, you know, Still some winter ahead of us, so that could change, but everything is uh, seems to be tracking in the right direction. Thank you, Jeremy. Does anybody have questions regarding the finance report? Matt, anything you wanted to add? Or John, since we have John as well? Uh, for me, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm good. Uh, uh, as Councilor Gabriel said, those are the two of uh, the higher points that I had pointed out earlier on the dashboard, but. Uh, we are uh, moving ahead uh, on track through the middle of the year plus. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so item number six on the agenda, we're going to have a presentation um, from Chrissy, I, I, I'll say Adamowitz. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Chrissy is from the National Resources Council of Maine and is going to present an overview for us um, for uh, details of the extended producer responsibility initiative that is um, coming before the legislature. Um, and this was also presented back in the fall to the recycling committee. So Chrissy, thank you very much for joining us. I see Matt's promoted you up into panelist position. So nice to see you there. And I uh, appreciate you bringing the presentation to the full council tonight. Yeah, thank you so much councilors for having me. Um, this is an issue um, that I, uh, as I've learned more about is, has just, I believe is so important. Um, and so I have a, a, a PowerPoint um, and if you don't mind, I'll share my screen and um, I'll just kind of keep my eye out for questions. You feel free to ask them along the way if you, uh, if you like. So let me, um, let me share my screen. Hopefully this works smoothly. 
<clears throat> Perfect. All right, you can see that. Um, great. Yep. And I'm going to open it up in full screen here. Okay, we still good? Yes, looks great. Okay. Lucy. Thank you. Okay, so um, I usually just start off just by reminding folks that. Um, you know, this presentation is about recycling and um, because recycling has um, been struggling over the past few years, I just want to remind people from an environmental perspective and a jobs perspective, recycling is the right thing to do. Um, but I won't read these statistics because I know we want to keep things fairly brief, but just know that we have these statistics. If you ever want to talk about the environmental benefits of recycling, I'm happy to do that um, later on. Um, you know, one stat that I definitely want to call out is that if Maine recycled 50% or more of its municipal solid waste, it'd be like taking 166,000 cars off the road. Um, so the reason that we're talking about recycling reform um, on the state platform, and the reason that I'm doing these sorts of presentations around the state to raise awareness um, is because of those uh, problems that we've been seeing with recycling since 2017-18. Um, in, in that year, uh, countries like China and other countries uh, around the world, uh, mainly in Asia, said basically we don't want to be a dumping ground anymore for uh, the Western world's uh, municipal solid waste, and a lot of that was recycling. Um, and so they said no more, and they've sort of closed their doors, and that really disrupted global markets for recycling. Um, that is why we started this process of educating the state um, as early as 2018 about EPR for packaging. Um, it's happening again in 2020 because, because of COVID in 2021. Uh, municipalities are struggling to afford recycling. Maine's recycling rates peaked at 40% uh, and are falling because of these two reasons. Um, so it's really a, a problem and we really have to take a statewide approach to recycling. Um, I've put this slide in to uh, clarify a little bit. You'll hear me say EPR for packaging. You'll hear me say packaging. And the reason that I'm using that word is because most of what's um, in our recycling bins is packaging. And packaging makes up about 40% of our municipal solid waste streams. So this is a, a huge portion of what we're talking about when we're talking about waste and, and household waste is just this, I, this packaging. And that's product packaging, the things that um, your cereal comes in, your, your toothpaste, uh, box and container. It's all, it's that kind of packaging that I'm talking about, the stuff that goes home with the consumer. Um, here's a closer look at uh, the structural, underlying structural problems that we, uh, that are causing our problems with recycling. Um, you know, at the surface, what we see is that municipalities are overwhelmed with providing these services. Um, we just recently got a sort of an up-to-date estimate from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection that um, recycling is about 60% um, uh, higher in cost than it is to just landfill these days. So that's a, that's a major cost, and that's been unexpected for municipalities for a few years now. Um, and that is related to ocean pollution because prior to the recycling crisis, a lot of places that were taking our recyclables didn't have the infrastructure to manage those responsibly. Um, and then the underlying problems are that producers don't hold responsibility and producers are brand owners like Amazon and Walmart, the folks that are introducing the large bulk of packaging into our municipalities in the first place, they don't have any stake in the game. Um, and so because of that, there's a lot of greenwashing and confusion, and that's really where the rubber hits the road with our uh, taxpayers and our, our residents. You know, they see uh, on their packages certain labels that indicate something's recyclable when it's really not, um, and that's rampant, and we don't have a way to fix that without EPR for packaging. Um, wasteful, unnecessary, evolving packaging is uh, another problem. And then at the end of the day, um, this, this final bullet here is really, I think, something that is, you know, really important to fix is that, you know, our taxpayers are responsible for a system that their volunteer efforts alone can't fix. And this, this part means a lot to me because I work with a lot of recycling committees. I'm on a recycling committee. And it's amazing how, uh, how many hours, how much effort our main um, neighbors are putting into fixing the recycling system. But at the end of the day, there are upstream systemic problems that need to be fixed. So here's you know, a little graphic that just show, sort of shows how we do recycling now. This is what it looks like. 
as you're probably familiar, the folks who are making the recyclables or the packaging are sort of, there's no coordination. They have no responsibility. They're not part of the system. And um, taxpayers, you know, give municipalities the funds to get rid of the trash. And that's really the way it's been in this country for a long time. Um, but this has to change if we're gonna address those upstream problems. Um, and some of, some of the outcomes of that particular way of doing things is that there's varied access between towns. So what you are able to recycle in Cape Elizabeth is different what, for what I'm able to recycle here in Brunswick. Um, and that causes con confusion and contamination because if I didn't know any better and I came to Cape Elizabeth, I could contaminate your recycling stream, not, not knowing any better. Um, and that's also a big problem for tourism because they're coming into our state. Um, and because of that, we see cutbacks and closures rampant across the state and that can lead to high costs. And it just creates this, this spiral problem that um, we, we alone um, at the local level have a hard time fixing. So you've, you've heard me toss out uh, a few times now this jargony term called extended producer responsibility for packaging. Um, and that's the industry term for a type of product stewardship law that brings the brand owners, the producers of packaging into the equation so that they share responsibility in managing all of that waste at the end of its life. Again, that's 40% of our waste stream is being managed alone by taxpayers, but this law would bring those producers into the equation to help us pay for it. And that's what product stewardship laws do. We have a lot of them in Maine, like the bottle bill is an example. We have mercury thermostats. There are a lot of examples and we have experience with this. And the people who are making those products help us manage it at the end of their life. And so going back to this graphic, this is how, how things would change. We take taxpayers out of the equation and put man manufacturers at the front of the equation a product stewardship organization would form, which is uh, pretty standard around the world. And we have that an example here in Maine with paint, paint Care. They're the product stewardship organization for paint. And then that money would be dispersed to municipalities. It would basically, basically be a reimbursement for that service that municipalities are offering to the brands to manage the waste that they're introducing into our communities. And here's a little bit of a closer look of how it would work. Bands, brands would pay fees based on the type of packaging that they're selling or they're introducing into the state. So, um, and that is based on recyclability. And that definition is um, what's recyclable, what's marketable at the end of its life for a consistent period of time, like two years or so. So there would be a de set definition for uh, recyclability. And that would re be really where this law would start is based on that definition. Because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we can move that material, our MRFs can move that material out of the state and make sure that it's getting recycled and do it at a, at a reasonable cost. Um, and then what I like about it is it really, uh, it really flips the um, idea of who's responsible um, on its head, you know, we're, we're offering, municipalities are offering the service and we should be compensated for it. We're, because there's a lot of ways you can innovate packaging so that it's not so wasteful. I could talk to you about that another time. I'm not gonna talk about it in this presentation for time purposes, but uh, there's a lot of innovating that can happen, but isn't happening because there's no incentive for it to happen. Uh, the way the bill is drafted, that those funds would be um, used, you could use them however you want because it's reimbursement. But, you know, we would hope that it would go to operations and infrastructure, to public education, and to increasing access. And by access, that's a geographical um, term, but also um, access to a number of different products that you might not be able to recycle otherwise. So, for example, my town of Brunswick had to cut glass because of the cost. Um, but this program could help us uh, incorporate glass back into our programs because the money would be there. Um, and geographically, you know, more rural parts of Maine that struggle to hold, uh, to host recycling programs um, would have that money to do so. Um, and so here's a look at, I just wanted to stick the slide in about brands because I've been saying brands would be responsible. This is a list of uh, 500 companies um, that pay for Canada's recycling programs. So this is done all over the world. Canada is one of the countries that benefits from doing recycling this way. And the types of brands that do it are those big, uh, big wealthy brands um, 
that introduce the bulk of packaging material into our communities. So all the stuff that's filling the shelves of the Walmarts, of the grocery stores, all the stuff that's being shipped here by Amazon, those are uh, companies that really can afford these programs and they do afford these programs in other parts of the world. And together, because there's thousands of them, the cost is very low and I'll get to that in a little bit. But this is uh, just a, a quick look at the types of brands that this law will target. It's not going to target local main businesses. There are big, big exemptions for local main businesses. And I'll show you those in a minute. We have these things on our website too. If you want to take a closer look, I'd be happy to send them to you. All right, so here's, here's the big headliner, especially for municipal officials. This, this program is meant to save taxpayers a lot of money. Um, it would take taxpayers out of the equation because you would be reimbursed for the cost of recycling. Maine DEP uh, estimates it would save 16 to 17 and a half million dollars annually across the state. And you're probably wondering how this works. So um, the way it works is you've got that product stewardship organization. It's basically, they're the missing middleman, right? There's no coordination for recycling or there's very little coordination for recycling. Um, and they would, be, they would be created and it would be their job to work with brands to make sure packaging is recyclable, more eco-friendly, less wasteful, and to make sure that those payments get to municipalities. So to, to participate, municipalities would have to accept what is readily recyclable. That would be sort of your job. Um, and you would have to submit data to the, the product stewardship organization. It would be their job to make sure that you could do that and that you know it was they would help you along the way. And then you get your reimbursement payments. Those payments would be, uh, municipalities are gonna be grouped into similar municipalities. So that's based on sort of population and sort of cost of, average cost of uh, to recycle um, for things like, you know, hauling and operations and stuff like that. Um, you can see here that the annual recycling paid payments would be on a median per ton basis and for non-recyclable packaging would be on a per capita basis. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, we have to bear the burden of those of that waste, you know, whether it's in a landfill or whether it's in litter, you know, we bear, we do bear a social and environmental cost and we should be compensated for it. Um, and then, you know, the, the cost, uh, town may be reimbursed for more if it's above or, or if it's below the median cost. And a lot of the, the, the details, uh, for the specific formula is gonna come out in when there's rulemaking. So it's not gonna be in the bill. This is sort of the level of detail is in the bill because that those formulas need to be flexible because the markets for recyclables change. They can change on like a per month basis. And so you don't wanna lock it in exactly in a bill because then it wouldn't become flexible and adaptable. So around the world, they do that. They give a little more flexibility to the product stewardship organization to work through those details. And from an environmental perspective, these programs have really proven to increase recycling rates. Um, so across Europe, recycling rates are well over 50%. Often they're in the 70% range or the 80% range. Um, and those places have been doing this for close to 30 years in some countries, like Belgium has done it a long time. Um, and uh, it does this because it fixes those upstream problems. So it incentivizes packaging made with recyclable materials. Um, and it incentivizes packaging that can be more easily recyclable. So that's, you know, uh, a good example is, you know, plastics number one and two are much more recyclable than plastics three through seven. So it incentivizes using plastics one and two, for example. Um, and in it, it, it fosters those system and infrastructure improvements that we just never make. Um, and then the access to and convenience factor is also important too. If you, know, if you want your residents to recycle, it needs to be convenient. It needs to be just as convenient as um, throwing things away in the trash and consistent messaging is part of that. Um, it would make it more resilient. This terrifying sign is one from Trenton, uh, Trenton Maine. <laughs> the recycle center closed, leave nothing. This happened here in Maine. <laughs> um, during in the 2018 um, time period when China was closing its doors to a lot of uh, our recyclables. Um, and so it makes our programs more resilient to change um, because that funding is stable and it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't really um, be affected so much by the whims of the market or by pandemics. You know, we were talking with our neighbors in Quebec who benefit from this program and they said, no, the pandemic hasn't really affected this all that much because the, because the funding stream is secure. 
Um, and, you know, again, it incentivizes, it gives us a way to finally address consumer confusion um, and address the sudden changes. If you talk with EcoMain, they'll tell you about the evolving ton about how brand owners just introduce new types of packaging without warning. And um, with technology increasing, those packages just get more and more complex, you know, more mixed materials. So that evolving time, we need a way to get ahead of that. So this law provides that framework uh, for getting there. Um, it keeps saying it's done all over the world. So this is just these four next four, sl four slides, excuse me. <clears throat> we'll show you how it's evolved. It started in Germany in 1991. And by 2003, it's really started to spread across Europe. By 2015, you've got Canada, Brazil, Australia, Russia doing this. In 2019, India and China announced plans to implement this. Um, in China, they're aiming for 2022. You can see that the United States is still in the dark. So uh, we haven't don't have this here yet um, for packaging. We have other product stewardship laws, but not for packaging yet. There are quite a number of states, other states that are working towards this, like Washington and Oregon, um, Maryland, New York, I believe Vermont. They're all working towards this right now too. So we're not the only ones working towards it, um, but um, it is important that one at least one state implements it. I hope we're the first though, because that would be pretty cool. Um, I mentioned earlier that this does not target small businesses. So there is a pretty large exemption for main small businesses. And you know, we we recognize we, we don't want to target main small businesses. They're not the they're not the parties introducing large amounts of packaging. They're not the party introducing doing all the greenwashing. Um, and so this is really important to us too. Um, so the exemptions that are written right now in the bill language is that less than $2 million in total gross revenue will exempt you. Uh, if you're producing less than one ton of packaging, that's about 95,000 paper cups. Uh, this, bit, this one's really big. If you have um, fewer than 100 full-time employees, you'll be exempt. So that should cover a big, um, a great number of businesses. And then importantly, the franchisee is not responsible. The parent company is. So it's corporate Burger King that will be responsible, not the local, uh, own, the owner of the local Burger King that's responsible. Um, and then just to show you uh, as an example, in British Columbia, where they do this law, um, the wealthiest 5% of businesses fund 80% of their program. So again, it's, you know, they're really designed to target those large companies. And then uh, someone always inevitably asked me about how this affects consumer prices. And, um, you know, we've ex researched this extensively and the folks who deliver these programs in other places tell us there isn't evidence that consumer prices are raised or that this is passed on to consumers. Um, and the reasons that they tell us um, are listed here. You know, first and foremost, price is complex. This policy alone doesn't isn't going to affect price, and it doesn't do that in places like Canada. You can sort of look at prices across the province, uh, across across the different provinces, and they don't change. Um, geography, local economies, consumer behavior, and price sensitivity are all those factors that affect price. And I'm sure there's many more than that. Um, you know, brands are pretty married to the .99 price tag, and they don't want to influence that or change that for this policy because the cost to them, my next bullet, is very low. It's actually fractions of a penny per container. So that, you know, that adds an administrative cost that they don't want to deal with. Um, in cases that they do, we've been told that they pass it on to luxury items because consumers are expecting to pay more for those anyway, and cost is not a factor in their purchasing decision. Um, and then we have examples uh, here in Maine uh, to sort of point the way, you know, the bottle bill did not raise prices here for soda. You, this soda costs the same in New Hampshire as it does here, but we benefit from the bottle bill, which has a 90% recycling rate. So it's been very successful. Um, and then I'm not gonna, unless you want me to, I could show you examples from other countries, but EPR has been shown to save producers a lot of money <laughs> because they're making, they're getting this, design help from this product stewardship organization. They're getting help on, you know, figuring out how to reduce waste and reduce the packaging um, waste, and, you know, so that it uh, saves them money sometimes. Um, so that, there, that there's an advantage there. Um, and then this picture I have here is a screenshot from the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. Um, you know, they're, in Canada, they do it by province, like we would do here by state. 
they're talking about doing a nationwide uh, law, but they haven't quite gotten there yet. So in Nova Scotia, they don't benefit from this law, but their neighbors in Quebec do. And they're a federation of municipalities, which is like our main municipal association. They're advocating for this type of law for Nova Scotia, because in the yellow box, you can see the prices are the same there as they are in Quebec. So they, they're experiencing the same prices, but they don't benefit. So that's why they're advocating. So that's sort of the evidence we have that the prices are not raised because of these types of laws. All right, so that's a little, that's enough about the, the actual bill. I think that covers it. I know we only have 15 minutes, but here's where the, the law is now. So it's been about three years in the making. Um, we were to, uh, 2019, um, the Resolve uh, 1431 was um, really the first step. Uh, we um, supported that in 2019. That was really a law to direct the Department of the Environmental Protection to uh, come back with a bill language. So it was really a more of a directive says, okay, we are interested in this, come back to us next year. And so they did, that was LD 2104 in 2020. Um, and that had broad support. The public hearing was almost exactly a year ago, it was at the end of February last year. It lasted eight hours and there was 163 pieces of testimony and 73% of those were in support. So it was approved by the Environment and Natural Resources Committee um, and it was going through the legislature, but then COVID made the legislature adjourned and it was never picked up again. Um, so that was really disappointing because no, no other state in the entire nation has gotten that far with an EPR for packaging law. Um, but you know we're still positive and that's why I'm here with you tonight is because we're doing it again this year um, with this legislature and we're doing education for municipalities so that you can support this law because um, it's, it's very good for municipalities. And the Maine Municipal Association supports this. Um, they testified last year, they're helping us again this year. They helped us draft this municipal resolution. And this is what we're asking municipalities to do. Um, this is a resolution. It's basically a letter of support. It says, you know, we're educated about this type of law and we generally support this type of law. It's not tied to the specific bill. Um, it's just tied to the directive to investigate this type of bill uh, with 1431. And it's non-binding, but that doesn't mean it's not important because legislators need to know that this is that municipalities want this, especially since we would be the first in the nation to adopt it. Um, so that, that's the ask that we're going around asking for is, is for you to adopt this official letter of support. NRCM is bringing them to the Environment and Natural Resources Committee public hearings. Um, so it'll be delivered by us on your behalf, but you can also submit it to your legislators if you'd like. And uh, again, it's, it's an important show of support. We have about 20, uh, I think it's 20 towns uh, representing over 200,000 meters who've already adopted this. Um, we also have a petition that's got, I think, close to 2,000 uh, signatures on it. So there's a lot of widespread support by Maine's, um, Maine's residents and taxpayers. And then for those listening, um, you can also sign our petition by going to NRCM's website or going to recyclingreform.org. This website, recyclingreform.org, has all of our information on it. Um, and also my contact info. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about this law. We also have a mascot. So if you're following on social media for the kids, we made a mascot. And that's that's how you know that this is the important recycling law. It's, his name is Boxy. We love him dearly. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening to that presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Chrissy, thank you for the information. Um, yes. Very much appreciated. Um, I do have a quick question. I see a couple others do as well. Um, who are the legislative sponsors um, that are part of this in initiative right now? Um, Rep Representative Nicole Grohuski is the sponsor this year. And, and I, I don't, I don't know if there, I don't know the co-sponsors. The bill hasn't been published yet and doesn't have a number yet. Um, so that's okay. sort of the, the trick there, but I could certainly find out if um, that's public information yet. Okay. And you're probably aware that the state Senator representing Cape Elizabeth sits on the joint Natural Resources Committee, yes. so, okay. Yes. Um, Penny, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. And you answered one of them, which is uh, 
uh, small businesses because small businesses have packaging similar to those larger corporations. So, which brings me to my second question, which is how within the waste stream do you separate out what comes from a large corporation and a smaller business? Or do you just make the assumption that uh, if the packaging looks like this, we're going to reimburse you? Because you, obviously in order to reimburse, you need to track. So uh, let's see uh, uh, the assumptions around how that would work. Well, it's a, it starts upstream. So your, your, your business is just exempt from paying fees because you pay the fee up front to sell into the state. So the brands register with the product stewardship organization if they don't meet those exemptions at the beginning of the year. And there's going to be a, a period, a transition period where, you know, data, there will be baseline data gathered in that transition period. But if you're exempt, then there, you know, you don't have any business with this. So uh, you're up, exempt up front that, and there's no downstream. That wasn't my question because I understood that. Okay. How do you within the waste stream determine what the reimbursement will be? Because you said that you had, uh, it appeared that it was some sort of tracking that needed to occur in order to know what you reimburse the towns. So it'll, so the, the towns will have to submit data on collection and if you don't do that, I think you should, you should know that Ecomain should be able to tell you that. And that is used to, you know, that would be sent to the P, the product stewardship organization. And um, mm -hmm. I can pull up my slide, but it was on a per ton basis for recycling and a per capita basis for landfilling. So, so it really doesn't matter what it is. You're just going based on there's packaging coming through. So there's going to be a number associated with it. You're not having to sort it out in any way. No, no. So yeah, yeah. So your your track right. your trucks are gonna have both. They're gonna have packaging from Hannaford in it, and they're gonna have packaging from your local business in it. But that doesn't matter because it's gonna be on a per ton basis. Okay, so it's at yeah. a high level. Okay, my yeah. next question is because you made the statement that um, and this type of approach increases recycling. Uh, explain to me how that occurs. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, you know, a lot, a lot of it has to do with, gosh, there's a lot. So um, first and foremost, they're, they're incentivized to use recyclable packaging in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. so, so a large portion of the packaging that we are seeing in our stores is not recyclable, right? And it's based on that definition about what's readily recyclable for the past two years. So right out of the gate, that's incentivized with, uh, with the fee structure. So that can that alone can increase recycling because if they're putting recyclable packaging into the system, you know that's what's coming out of the system, and our municipalities and our MRFs can get a, a good price for that at the end of the day and make sure that it's recycled. Um, another another benefit for these laws is it actually creates a transparency structure so that we know what's being sold at the end of the day is getting recycled. Um, you know that's that's a very common benefit of these laws. Um, consumer, consumer confusion and education. Um, I could pull up a slide if it would help you to have a visual. No, no. no. Okay. Um, so, you know, a lot of um, products say they're recyclable on the packaging and when they're just simply not. <laughs> what my slide has a picture of a plastic tag that comes in a plant pot. You know, you go to the garden center, there's like those tags in the plant pots and it says, this is, it says it's a number six plastic and it says, put this in your curbside bin. It's recyclable. Not true. That's going to contaminate the paper source at EcoMain and probably Casella too. So there's a big difference between what's technically recyclable, what somebody in a lab could recycle, and what's practically recyclable. What's something that our municipalities can actually recycle and get a market fair market price for? Um, so there's that. So then, and then it also creates a fund for education and uh, for our municipalities. And that's a big thing that's missing is consistent education because as I said earlier, what's recyclable. In my town, it's not necessarily recyclable in your town, but people don't know that. And they just assume that what's recyclable in one place is recyclable in another. And that causes confusion, confusion and contamination. Contamination, you know, if, there, if that happens, that bale might not be able to be recycled at the end of the day. So it can, can confusion and contamination kind of work together to determine whether a bale of recyclables is actually getting recycled. So that's another big problem. Um, so having that education and that statewide, more consistent education statewide would really help with recycling rates. 
And then collection too, simple, sorry, simple collection, like money for bins and money to pick up bins, you know, that, that's another example. Other questions from anybody, feedback? I don't see anybody raising hands. Okay. Um, well, Chrissy, again, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the council can discuss um, potentially putting the resolution on a future agenda. Um, what's, what's sort of the timing for that a, as part of this whole process? Um, you know, I, um, I, I hate to say it, but I think as soon as you can, <laughs> because yeah. I know that's not helpful, but you know, the, the bill could come up uh, at any time. They don't really give you a lot of notice. And so if you want the resolution for the public hearing, it's better to address it sooner rather than later. So we could get it to the committee for you. And what other um, communities have, have signed on to the resolution thus far? Yeah, those, I mean, not, those doesn't are, have to be an exhaustive list, but I mean, if you... Yep, yeah, those are on our website and you can click okay. to, on their names to see them, but you know, Brunswick, Harpswell, um, Falmouth, the Port, you know, Portland, South Portland, um, we've even had some interior towns like Poland, um, Lubeck. So we had Lewiston, we have a diversity of towns that have done it. Okay. Super. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much all for having me. Bye now. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda is item seven, uh, citizen opportunity for discussion of items that are not on tonight's agenda. We do have a pretty full agenda and a big crowd uh, at this point that's up to over 70 people. Um, I know that lots of folks that are joining tonight want to talk about stuff that's on the agenda, but is there anybody who wishes to speak about something that's not on the agenda? And if you would like to, please use the raise hand function in uh, the Zoom meeting. and. Um, when you're recognized, please just give your name and address and limit your comments to about three minutes, please. Um, so I see the hand of Mark Craig raised. So Mark, Matt will open up your mic and go ahead. Okay, my uh, hand raised by mistake. Sorry, no comment on oh. it. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anybody else uh, that wishes to speak about something that's not on tonight's agenda? Okay, seeing nobody, we'll go to the town manager's monthly report. Matt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief, uh, knowing that you do have a lot of work on your plates for this evening. I, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Councilors Noonan and Devereaux, as well as uh, Planning Board Chair Jim Huebner for attending last week's Municipal Stormwater Conference, which was a workshop that was put on by Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District and may uh, impact us over the next 10 years as, the, as new rules and regulations come in as we qualify. Uh, but I wanted to thank them uh, in person due to their, uh, they provided us some extra credits towards our certification. So uh, thank you for taking that time. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, you learned as much as I did uh, going on. It was, it was well, a very well attended event. And uh, thank you for, for spending more additional time. The uh, budget is progressing and uh, we have an item later on this evening looking to get the high level uh, budget guidance from the council as to directions you'd like us to do. Uh, as we have all the department heads have provided their information to me and John Q uh, to move that information forward. And we will be having that delivered to the council uh, by March 5th. And then uh, last week we began collective bargaining uh, with the, uh, the policeman's union as well as the public works uh, collective bargaining units. So uh, both meetings started off well and are looking forward to having those resolved in time for the start of the next fiscal year. And we can have that plugged in and ready to go on the next budget. So. Uh, that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I, I do know that uh, you do have a lot. So thank you for the time. Anybody with any questions for Matt? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the approval of the draft minutes of the meeting held on January 11th, 2021. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as included in the agenda? So moved. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Noonan. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, Deb, could you call the vote, please? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? 
Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, next, if there's no objection from others on the council, uh, I'm going to move to take item number 47-2021, which appears as number 16 on the agenda, out of our regular order of business this evening and move that to the front um, so that we can get that taken care of and moved on, knowing that the items preceding it, uh, though pursuant to council order, um, will take quite a long time. And I'm hoping that we can be efficient with um, the applicants uh, time who are requesting the street name change. So if nobody objects to that, seeing, seeing no objection, we'll move on um, to item 47-2021. Um, this is a request for a street name change, uh, changing it from Waltman Way to Tanglewood Place. Uh, this has been reviewed by Chief Paul Fenton, who's the addressing coordinator and is in conformance with the appropriate chapter of uh, the addressing ordinance section of our town ordinances. Uh, there are no other homes on this road and the suggested name is not duplicative with the names of any other streets in Cape Elizabeth. The proposal uh, is with the agreement of uh, the tax assessor, Clinton Sweat, the aforementioned addressing officer and fire chief, Paul Fenton. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? I see, um, uh, the requester, Steve Tonkovich, has raised his hand. Steve, if you could just, obviously we have part of your address here, <laughs> but for uh, the record, if you wouldn't mind giving us your address and limiting your comments to about three minutes, please, and your mic is open. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Steve Tonkovich. Uh, my wife, uh, Marsha, and I uh, moved into uh, Cape Elizabeth just around Thanksgiving. Uh, as you know, the address, we're on Waltman Way. Uh, the chief reason for changing the address is that we are not in any databases for uh, address for GPS, for US mail, you need a post office box, et cetera. Uh, so we're requesting to change the name to something more appropriate to, in fitting with the township. Um, the uh, Tanglewood has uh, been selected as the name because we have uh, a bramble patch on the edge of the property along with an apple tree. And uh, it just seems more appropriate than Waltman, which was named after the architect. Uh, so we. Uh, Appreciate the consideration and uh, ask uh, your approval for the address change. And in respect for your time, I'll thank you very much and leave it at that. Thank you very much, Mr. Tonkovich. Uh, is there anybody else from the public that wanted to speak on this item? I see no hands raised. Is there anyone uh, that would like to make a motion? I'll make a motion, Jamie. Um, Go ahead, Penny. Okay. Uh, I move that the council approves the request of Stephen and Marsha Tonkovich to change the name of their street from Waltman Way to Tanglewood Place, pursuant to Chapter 22 addressing ordinance and in accordance with Section 227-1 notification and inspection. Thank you. Moved by Councilor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Second that. Seconded by Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, Deb, could you call the roll for the vote, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Councilor Caitlin Sorry, Jordan? I condemn you, yes. <laughs> Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We'll return to the regular order of the agenda, which is first uh, item number 32-2021, which is number 10 on the agenda. This was tabled from the January 11th meeting, the authorization of transfer funds for account series 0640 through 0660. Um, uh, the finance director, John Corderaro, is with us and assures me that his microphone is working. So um, I'm just going to open it up to John to give an introduction of this item. And then I'll ask if there's anybody from the public that wishes to comment. John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, my apologies to the council and to uh, the public that the uh, last time this came up, my uh, microphone was not working and I could not be heard. Secondly, I'd like to apologize that the memo that I provided at the last meeting did not have sufficient detail. Uh, so I've provided a 
uh, a follow-up memo dated February 1st and detailed that some of the issues that uh, I'm working with both community service and public works has to do with the span of control for the public works director and how many different uh, departments uh, or divisions he has to control. And this action would take a number of those that he has responsibility for, move them up into the 300 series where public works and the recycling center are located rather than in the 600 series, which has more individual divisions than and spread over a number of different departments. Um, that would make budgeting much easier to deal with. It would make managing the funds much easier and much more effective. And I've provided uh, in the material that was submitted uh, an alternative uh, order, which would leave uh, Fort Williams Park where it currently is, although both the uh, public works director and the community services director have asked that that be moved and, uh, and uh, be incorporated into a single comprehensive uh, parks and grounds division. Thank, thank you, John, for the explanation. Um, I will ask if there's anybody from the public that would like to speak on this agenda item. I don't see any hands going up. Um, would any counselor like to make a motion or um, if, if there's clarifying questions prior to a motion that you'd like to ask for the finance director, um, either of those at this time? Councilor Penny Jordan. I have a question and yep. and um and I'm sorry I'm just I'm not as like ingrained in all of the different um, um accounts and everything uh that you are um John but my my basic question is will one easily be able to see all of the expenses associated with Fort Williams in one place Good. Yes and no. Um, okay. Discreet, discreetly, no, because uh, personnel would be wrapped up into an individual line. Um, okay. And that's why I provided an alternate uh, opportunity uh, council order, which would leave uh, Fort Williams Park where it currently is. I, I just am, um, because it's one of our, our bigger items when it comes to uh, managing it and expenses and things, I, I just think from a transparency perspective, we don't want people to have to put a puzzle together. That's, well, that's um, just where I come from. And I understand that, but uh, first of all, if you look at the audited financial statements that go back this year, last year or any number of years, there is no separate reporting over time in the published reports as far as uh, Fort Williams Park goes. Uh, mm -hmm. The Fort Williams Park has a separate fund for capital improvements and that is mm -hmm. not uh, being uh, considered in this. But again, if the council determines that that is an important piece of information that should be left in place, I provided an opportunity for the council to make that decision and to address that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, John. John, you said that was the preferred alternative for both the public works and community services and Fort Williams Park director? Or yes. did I hear that correct? They both provided Yes, and, and they both provided uh, memos that were included with the memo that I submitted yep, to right. the town manager. Other questions, uh, Jeremy? Thank you, um, Jamie. Um, I, I, I support this. I, I think it will make it easier from a budgeting tracking perspective for the department heads, but I also, 
I think that Penny raises a good point or a, um, or a good, you know, yeah, good point. Um, th there are certain cost centers that we have in the town where it's, it's not easy to draw a line and say, this is how much this particular item is, is costing us because, because of the way that we budget for personnel, because of the way, you know, th they're just drawing on revenue from, from shared services in a, in a variety of places. I think Fort Williams Park is a good example, but it's by no means the only one. Um, and so I think in addition to this, one of the things that I'd like to see us moving toward is, you know, developing some sort of a, a simplified reporting system that could, you know, draw from these reports, but make it a little easier to say, okay, here's, here's all of the expenses and revenues that are associated with Fort Williams Park sort of pulled together in one, in one piece. And I don't know that we have to necessarily do that for every piece of the town budget, but for some of the larger, more visible places within the town budgeting structure, like Fort Williams, like the fire and rescue department. Um, I know I have always struggled in the budget to follow the revenue lines for emergency services back to the budgeted expenses. It's, just, it's a challenging thing to do. Um, so, I, I, but I think that that can happen in conjunction with, with the proposal that, that John Q has brought forward tonight. Uh, if I can address um, your Please. concerns. Uh, first of all, as far as rescue goes, last year we finished the rescue fund with a deficit of $862,000. And I recommended that we uh, move the rescue fund back into the general fund. Uh, the rescue fund is set up as a separate division within the fire department. Uh, I, in terms of uh, revenues, last year for the first time, we provided revenues by departments rather than just a long list. Uh, in addition, the uh, report for January that were uh, published last week included a change in the revenue reporting and it's organized on a departmental basis so that you could go and look and say, for the fire department, what was the budgeted revenues for the fire department and what was the amount that was received? And you can compare that too. Unfortunately, the software that we use does not allow me to take revenues and expenditures and bring them together into an income statement. Um, I would much prefer that, um, but I don't have that as, as an option. It would take a lot of extra work to make that happen, but I will continue to try and make that work uh, on the go forward. Uh, in terms of, if you take a look at community services, uh, Kathy's revenue accounts are all over the place. But again, I was able to work with this system, reorganize it, so you can now see what the revenue stream is just for community services. Uh, and that is subtotaled within the revenue report. And then you can compare that to the uh, expense report for community services. So I appreciate what you're saying, Councilor Gabrielson. I absolutely agree with you and I'm looking for ways to make the system work better for the managers as well as the council as well as the public so that there is much better information available rather than just an information dump and people then you figure out how to make it work. Councilor Devereaux. Chair Garvin. Um, John, it sounds to me like this is um, going to streamline it for our our managers and basically save time and energy for them. Is that what we're really doing? Yes, ma'am. And um, I I'm going to agree to do this. You're the professional, the person we've hired to make these sorts of changes. So I trust your um, ability here, and I think this is a great idea. Thank you. Are there other questions uh, seeking any additional information or clarification from John? Um, 
seeing none, uh, recalling my training on Robert's Rules of Order, I'm first going to look for a motion to take this item off the table. So could somebody please make that motion? I'll move to take um, this item. It's fine. Off the, off the table. Thank you, Councilor Devereaux. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Gaberson. Uh, I don't think that that uh, requires a vote, uh, with just a motion and a second on taking something off the table though. So um, so with that, is, uh, is there any discussion on uh, or a motion uh, on the item? Anybody? I'll read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I move that the, the um, Cape, Cape Elizabeth Town Council approves $594,457 of the approved FY 2021 budget from the following divisions parks, 640, ground, school grounds, 641, Fort Williams, 645, and trees, 660, to be transferred to a new division, parks and grounds, 330 under the control of the Public Works Department. 24,400, 24, yeah, of the approved FY 2021 budget in Division 640 to be transferred to a new CIP project in Department 715 titled Greenbelt Trail Improvements under the control of the Town Planner with advice of the Conservation Committee and the remaining 113,643 in the Division 645 Fort Williams Park be under the control of community services. Is there a second to that motion? I second. Councilor Noonan, any discussion? Seeing none, Deb, could we have a roll call for that vote, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, thank you very much, John. Um, next up is uh, item 11, which is to be a public hearing on the short-term rental amendments. As um, Many folks know uh, the council has been working for some time now on revisions and amendments uh, to the short term rental ordinances uh, and uh, tonight uh, our intention is to hold a public hearing uh, to hear from the public, uh, which we've heard a great deal from um, certainly uh, through the throughout the process on this. Um, as well as through email uh, leading up to the meeting this evening, so thank you um, to all the Community members that. Um, have been along for the ride for that whole process and uh, for those that have reached out to us in advance of this meeting um, to share their their point of view as well. Um, so um, everyone uh, who's interested in speaking on this, uh, if you could uh, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting. Uh, you'll be recognized and uh, once you're recognized, please give your name and your address uh, and please limit your comments to three minutes um, for which I will be timing. So you probably hear a little, a little beeping go off after the three minutes if you hit that. So um, the hands have gone up. The first one in the queue is Lisa Chanzit. So when Matt opens up your mic, Lisa, if you could just give us your address and uh, your mic should be open now. Lisa Chanzit, 36 Lawson Road. Can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Short-term rentals represent a commercial business in residential neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth. They provide a financial benefit to a small minority of the citizens, and they provide no advantage to the town whatsoever. The only, they only provide disadvantages and costs to both residential neighborhoods and the town. Many local entities around the country and in Maine have banned STRs. But if banning STRs in Cape Elizabeth is not deemed feasible, please retain the limits on STRs in the proposed ordinance 
These already represent a compromise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I move to the next um, member of the public for speaking, I, I did want to just, um, for anyone that wasn't clear, uh, indicate that the intent of the council is to vote on this at our March meeting after holding the public hearing tonight. Um, so uh, typically on, you know, sort of large, um, you know, high impact types of things like this, we have the public hearing um, and, and take all, all of that input into consideration and come back at our next meeting uh, for the vote. So that's the, that's the plan as far as this is concerned, uh, just so everybody's aware of that. Um, the next person in the queue is Jim Kearney. Uh, Jim, your mic's open, so go ahead. Good evening, my name is Jim Kearney. I live at 1015 Shore Road. Um, I wanted to thank the council for tackling this challenging issue. And I know that there are some hot spots in town where this has been particularly problematic. I completely agree with trying to maintain the sense of community. I think that makes a lot of sense. In this case, I think that there are a couple of bad eggs um, that are kind of ruining it for the rest of the people that participate with short-term rentals. And I think that the, um, we had, we previously had that 14 day kind of exemption from all of the rules and regulations. In my mind, I think it makes sense that we keep that for people that are doing it on an occasional basis. That we've swung the pendulum too far with the uh, regulations that are pr proposed in this set of amendments specifically around some of the uh, recording, the home visits, the documentation, and the uh, additional electrical work that would have to be done to houses. I think it's a great opportunity for people to, you know, for me to rent out my house and then for me to take that money and go somewhere else in the country. I know the people that have rented here at, uh, at our house have uh, used the town facilities extensively, love it, and in some cases come back each year. So it's been a, been a great program for us, but I, I would just like to see the council make sure that the pendulum doesn't swing too far towards um, uh, dire regulations that kind of um, dampen the opportunity for people who are not violating the spirit of the uh, community with their rentals. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next in the queue is um, Photon Attic. So if you could give us your name and your address, please. Um, your mic's open, go ahead. You might be muted on your own end. Are you there? Um, why don't we go to the next person in the queue and hopefully we can get the audio straightened out for that person. Um, sorry about that technical difficulty. Uh, again, it might have been that uh, you were muted on your end. Um, the next person up is Sarah Morisot. Uh, Sarah, your mic's open. Go ahead. Hi, this is Sarah Morisot. I'm at 55 Richmond Terrace. The draft ordinance is a compromise between business interests and residents' right to the quiet, peaceful enjoyment of our homes in residential zones. With the proposed ordinance, our problems here on Richmond Terrace may lessen or change, but they will not be solved. We will still require the help of the code enforcement officer and the police department. Both have expressed that they don't have the resources to monitor and enforce this ordinance. In the compromise, there are four critical parts that offer protection to CAPE's residential zones from big business. I sent in a letter that speaks to the importance of each of these protections individually and collectively. They're in B1, B2, C3, and F8. If you remove or weaken any of these resident protections, as some counselors suggested they were interested in doing in the last workshop, we will no longer have a compromise and we'll be right back to where we started 18 months ago. Tonight, I'd like to focus in on just one of these sections, section B2 for unhosted rentals. The ordinance just doesn't go far enough here. Unhosted rentals are like letting a hotel operate without the owner or any staff on site. It's a business case you would never permit in a business zone. The current ordinance allows unhosted renting all year long. This is the main source of the problems on Richmond Terrace and is what contributes most to my stress as a resident and as a parent of young kids. Your compromise in the ordinance is a cap. 
but at your last STR workshop, counselors suggested wanting to extend or even to remove the cap on the days you can rent without a business owner present. Even as we all heard the planning board consensus, the STRs are a quote, commercial use that is incompatible with the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of residential neighborhood properties. And even after we heard the planning board recommend that unhosted STRs not be permitted in the residential zoning districts. So if the professionals on our planning board can't convince you how bad unhosted rentals are for residential zones, I probably can't either, but I'm gonna give it one more try. So here's some color on why I think you should focus and follow on the advice of the planning board and ban unhosted rentals. Owners and property managers say they're diligent about screening their customers, but in my experience, they don't ask the important safety questions that a working parent would ask. Here are some screening questions I'd ask. When you arrive in the dark at 10 p.m. and you're excited to be in Maine, are you planning to slam doors and hoot and holler and run up and down my street and wake up my kids? Will you stare at me and my kids at the bus stop, making me wish I'd brought my car with me for safety? Will you make me rush home from work to meet the bus so my kids don't have a bad interaction with you or your unleashed dog? When you're hungover on Sunday morning, will you pee in the bushes where my kids could see you? Do you plan to drive 40 miles per hour down our dirt road where my kids are playing and where older residents are walking? When the power goes out and there's no heat in your rental, will you come knock on my door and interrupt my family's dinner? And when you get to your rental and the door's locked and the lights aren't on and your cell phone doesn't get any service, will you come knock on my door late at night and ask me what you should do? So these are some of the unsafe behaviors and there are plenty of others that really need to stop. I firmly believe that if owners are at home and they're expected to be actively managing their customers, they'll ask the right screening questions and will weed out disruptive, unsafe customers. If a business owner is going to use the internet to invite strangers into our neighborhoods, these are people they don't know, they're people no one in our neighborhood knows, the town should demand that the owner be home to meet them, to answer their questions, to monitor their behavior, and to make sure they do not disrupt our peace and quiet. The comprehensive plan tells us that we have right, a right to that here in Cape. So if you voted for the comprehensive plan and you believe that all residents are due quiet and peace and enjoyment in a residential zone, you should vote unhosted rentals out of this ordinance. If you believe that a working parent raising kids in Cape is due the safety and comfort of knowing who's living next door and who lives at your bus stop, you should vote unhosted rentals out of this ordinance. If you heard at the February 1st workshop that our town needs long-term rentals, you should vote on hosted rentals out of this ordinance. Unhosted rentals will flip to long-term housing really quickly. If you think our code enforcement officer and police department should be spending their resources in support of residents and not on absent business owners and unruly customers, you should vote on hosted rentals out of this ordinance. And if you don't want us to come back to you in six months with these same issues, you should vote on hosted rentals out of this ordinance. The same unhosted nuisance activities that we are experiencing today were discussed back in 2012. If you don't address this root issue again, and if you skip over banning unhosted rentals again, we will be having the same discussion with you again very soon. So please ask yourself how many more neighborhoods need to be disrupted or destroyed by unhosted SDR businesses before you're ready to take strong action against them. I thank you again for your time and I look forward to your vote. Thank you. Um, I want to remind everybody to please try and keep your comments to three minutes. It's tough for me to jump in uh, in the Zoom format to try and cut people off. I don't I don't want to cut people off. I want to have everybody have the chance to speak. We have a very full agenda tonight, this item included. So please try and be respectful of the three minute time um, if you could. Uh, next up is Doug Dransfield. Doug, um, when Matt opens your mic, go ahead. Go ahead now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm Doug Dransfield in the 48 Richmond Terrace. And uh, it's very fortunate that I get to follow Sarah, my neighbor. I hope you could all hear the emotion in her voice and how disruptive this has been to her family. And uh, know that that's not a single example in the community. I specifically wanna talk about two things. One is this idea that uh, traditionally in Cape, it's been permissible to rent your house out and go to the lake or some other place. You know, it's only a couple of weeks. It's not gonna bother anybody. That might've been true 40 years ago when the house you were, you were renting to your neighbor's family 
or your neighbor's friends or people that were known, or maybe you would put an ad in the New York Times, or maybe you'd put an ad in the Boston Globe. But that's not the way we, we are now. Now we have innumerable internet sites, so many that we have to hire a private firm to scrub the internet to find the places that are being advertised that can invite anybody from anywhere in the world to come to our community and live in an unsupervised manner. I think this is totally inappropriate. I think it's totally out of line with what we want our town to be. And the other thing I'd like to say is that I think you continue to have a problem with enforcement that remains un, well, not unaddressed, but underaddressed. And I don't think that the current uh, ordinance has any real solution for this. We've heard from both the, or the uh, code enforcement officer and the police that they're not in, that they find this uh, onerous to have to take this on. They've not used the word onerous, but that's what I've heard them say. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next is Julie Armstrong. And go ahead, Julie, your Thank address, please. Uh, my name is Julie Armstrong and I live at 32 Lawson Road and I'm Chairman Garvin and members of the town council. Thank you very much for letting me speak tonight. Um, I'm not gonna repeat everything in my email to you, but I did wanna emphasize the primary points, which are first that unhosted short-term rentals must be limited to primary residences. That's very important to have um, any short-term rentals be by an owner who is vested in the neighborhood and has relationships with the neighbors. Second, the seven-day minimum really needs to be maintained. I know there's been some talk about eliminating that in recent meetings. And I would say that for every change in tenants comes not only a new set of strangers, but also additional turnover crews, cleaners, trash collectors, repair crews, property agents, et cetera. Third, counting all stays as rentals for licensed short-term rentals. We have been the victims of um, having um, short-term rentals where there were two or three turnovers in a week and the renters claimed or the, uh, the, um, the short-term uh, renter claimed to be friends or uh, family members and not tenants. And there was really nothing that Ben could do about it. That's a problem. Um, and finally, the number of rental nights really needs to be restricted. I would suggest that 42 nights a year is way too many, that when you consider in Maine, in Cape Elizabeth, the time between 4th of July and Labor Day is really our unofficial summer. 42 nights really covers the vast majority of that period of time. And that corresponds with a time when we all want to enjoy our property on the outside, our yards, et cetera, and when we are most affected by short-term rentals in the neighborhood. Um, and finally, I've been concerned about all of the focus of the uh, property rights issues of short-term rentals. And I would suggest that while this argument might sound appealing, that analyzing this issue in terms of the rights of residential property owners to engage in commercial activity really is backwards. One of the primary purposes of zoning is to protect the property rights of all owners. And this protection is accomplished by limiting the use of property. I believe that each member of the town council has a very simple choice to make. Will you protect the ability of a very small group of property owners to use their residential property for what is essentially a commercial activity? Or will you protect the people enjoyment of the town's other approximately 4,000 residential properties to preserve the character of Cape Elizabeth's neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, Victoria Valent. Go ahead, Victoria. And can you hear me? Loud and clear, thanks. Okay. Well, I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Tremendous amount of respect for all the work uh, that you've conducted over the past year and a half. So many meetings, so many emails, so much that you've heard. Um, 
I won't reiterate and, and go into too much. I, I just want to hammer home that please keep the minimum seven day scheduling in there. This is so beneficial to the neighbors. Please keep the primary residence. Once again, this is regarding housing stock and, and just making sure that we have uh, housing for our family, people to move into the community. And I feel very strongly that there are so many people that don't want the short-term rentals, period. You, you heard it from the planning board. I'm sure if you ask the code enforcement officer, planning, uh, city hall staff, they'd probably say, we could do without these short-term rentals. So, um, and we've all piped in saying we don't care for them, but it's a compromise. And so, yes, there will be short-term rentals, compromise. We're not getting what we want. They're not getting what they want because there's going to be a lot of restrictions. But I really, truly say it has to stop with the unhosted short-term rentals. It is the unhosted that is the cause of the problems. When you hear everyone complaining, it's about the unhosted. When you hear Ben saying how difficult this will be to enforce, he's talking about the unhosted because that's where the problems come from. Same with police. It's the unhosted. So I would just add to all the people since 2012 who have been begging and pleading for just four people on the council to vote to ensure that they also can enjoy their property. And we just need four people to say, yes, let's have a true compromise. We're going to have short term rentals, they're going to be highly restricted. And we're going to do away with the unhosted, because that's where all the problems lie. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, next up is Zev Meyerwitz. Uh, go ahead, Zev, your mic's open. Hi, Chair Garvin, members of the Town Council. Um, I too want to thank everyone for the endless and ceaseless work that everybody is putting forward on this individual topic. Um, it's certainly a contentious issue uh, with a lot of sentiment on both sides. Um, I, I wanna just come out and say, uh, I hear and support uh, what everybody is saying. Uh, I personally, uh, for my wedding, uh, rented a house on Richmond Terrace and while I was adamant about peaceful and quiet enjoyment with with my um, bridal party. You know, I can see how that can very much be an issue for people that might have been less constrained or, or respectful of their their neighbors. And I, I really does hit on a personal level. Um, I also support much of the sentiment on the um, unhosted rentals. I, I I do think that you know there when we take a deep dive on this, it's it's simply a commercial use in a residential district, and you know we definitely have to find a compromise on that. Um, I just want to point out uh, in reviewing all the language so far um, regarding short-term rentals that I, I don't see as much as we talk about these uses being a commercial use within a residential zone, I don't see any, um, any allowances for these uses within a commercial zone. Um, as, as you may or may not know, I, I do reside at 12th Way in the town center. Um, I do have a short-term rental. Um, I am hosted and uh, the, the, uh, unit is managed both by myself as well as a property manager. And I, I don't see any allowances or any you know, support for the commercial use being in a zone that would seem appropriate for it. Um, you know, while I don't uh, personally use the unit 365 days a year, I prefer to do a, a summer rental with a school year rental because I think that adds greater value to Cape Elizabeth with a family that's looking to move into town and try to make the school year um, I think that it would make more sense in my case to have the flexibility of being able to do things less than a week. Um, but I also, I just want the, the council to hear that, you know, everything that I'm seeing so far, I think everyone's trying to meet a compromise, but we're, we're missing one small area and not recognizing that this is a commercial use and, and perhaps providing some increased ability to use that um, within a commercial use. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, again, I, I do applaud all your work and um, good luck with the rest of the uh, voices. Thank you very much. Next up is Tim Hebda. Tim, your mic is open, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Tim Hebda, 55 Richmond Terrace, audio clear? Yep. Ah, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I've been a part of this process from the beginning, which now is close to 18 months or so. 
And it's been my stance from the beginning that unhosted short-term rentals should be banned. Uh, most recently, this council sent a proposed STO ordinance to the planning board. The board provided rich insight that should not be ignored. Uh, key statements from the planning board included the finding that the proposed ordinance is confusing and ultimately impossible to enforce. Uh, the planning board also stated that uh, STRs are a commercial use that's incompatible with the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of residential properties. So for me, this brings about the question of why are these businesses still allowed in residential neighborhoods? And even within this new ordinance, why is the council propping up the business model? Uh, Short-term rentals bring no real value to Cape Elizabeth as a whole. Uh, and in the eyes of the council, perhaps my peaceful enjoyment of my property is secondary to the economic growth of a multi-million dollar industry. My family's home is the scenic backdrop for others' unstaffed hotels. Ordinances set the standard and short-term rentals do not enhance, they don't maintain the character of our community. In fact, these unsupervised businesses are turning our neighborhoods into smaller versions of the transient sections of Higgins Beach and Old Orchard Beach. The town council should protect our community and ban all unhosted rentals in residential areas. That should be the standard. However, if this council chooses to support unstaffed hotels in our small neighborhoods, then please maintain the protections that are currently a part of the proposed ordinance. These protections will not erase the negative behaviors of STR businesses. In fact, it, their effectiveness is unknown because it is a proposed ordinance. And this new ordinance, it's a compromise. And with this compromise in mind, I encourage you to finalize the ordinance come March and maintain that only primary residents are able to obtain an STR permit. Cap the days that STR properties can rent. Fewer than 42 nights will allow STR property owners to cover their taxes. Maintain the seven day buffer between customers. Please tie an owner's ability to renew a permit to their record in upholding the good neighbor guidelines. And lastly, count all activity, including that of family and friends who are staying in an STR as STR activity. Maintaining these protections within the compromise of the new ordinance will provide some relief from the negative impacts of STRs. Thank you all for the time you've put into this, crafting the ordinance, listening to the community, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Tim, appreciate it. Um, next up is Cindy. You don't have a last name there. So Cindy, when Matt gets your mic open, we'll go to uh, you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, oh, I apologize. I, I just received uh, uh, a notice from Zoom saying that uh, this person is not allowed to talk because Cindy's using an older version of Zoom. And uh, okay. there, is, there is a workaround if we promote uh, Cindy to a panelist, if you're comfortable with doing that. That's fine. Okay. Sorry for the delay. No problem. Take your time. Oh, oh Cindy, I just lost you. Oh, there you go. Cool. <laughs> you good? Yes. Hi. Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Can what? we get your oh. name and address, please? Hi, my name's Cindy Doucette. I live at 43 Richmond Terrace with on the same road as three of the people who have spoken tonight. I understand their concerns. Um, but I'm not on the same page. I have rented my home out as an unhosted short-term rental from uh, 2012 to 2019. This past summer, I did not rent because of the pandemic. Um, my, before we start, I started renting, my son and I went to a lawyer and had a rental agreement written up specifying what the rules were and had each um, family or individual sign that rental agreement before they came to my home. In eight years, I had no problems with the neighbors um, as far as the renters were concerned and minimal issues as far as the rental otherwise. I feel that the 42 day rental period for unhosted rentals is too short. It's only half the summer. It's very limiting. Um, I feel that I need to continue renting my home in the summer for now in order to stay here. And it is not just to be able to pay the taxes. Um, so I can understand both points of view, but I think there definitely needs to be a compromise on both sides. Uh, I also uh, have a couple of questions. Um, as far as the 
one issue or one thing that it said in the proposed ordinance is that each tenant must comply with seven day stay requirement. And then later on it said um, that people, that you couldn't rent to more than one party, I believe, within seven days. So what does the seven day uh, stay requirement mean? Does that mean you advertise for the seven days and charge them for seven days? or that you just can't have maybe more than one party within the same week for seven days. The other question I have is um, as far as when the um, ordinance is passed and we're able to get permits this year, I'd like to know when that is because uh, it's already getting a little late to start advertising for this summer's rentals. Uh, Cindy, I'm happy to address at least the first comment um, to answer your question, um, and thank you for your comments. The seven-day period is uh, effectively not a change from the current requirements for unhosted, um, whereby uh, whether you rent to somebody for one day or you rent for somebody for seven days, you can only have one set of guests in there during that period. Um, so it's intended to provide a buffer and resting period um, before turning over the property. So you don't, the, the, the tenant is, does not have to, the guest does not have to rent for seven days. They could rent for one day, two days or whatever in between or more than seven days, frankly. Okay. Um, but, but they, um, you can't, you couldn't have multiple bookings within the same seven day period. Um, so that's number one. The second question you had pertained to uh, issuance of permits. And um, the timeline that we laid out uh, at our last discussion on this, um, and I think is included in the language accompanying the, um, uh, the current uh, draft of the amendments is that it would take place, uh, take effect July 1 of this year. So. Okay, then, so when can we after start? That, after that, it would revert to a calendar year permitting cycle beginning on January 1. Okay, so when would we a half year be able to? When will we be able to start advertising our properties for rental? I can't advise you on that. Um, so I, I have no idea whether or not you're. Well, that, I, I think you, that's I think you really said important. Primary, yeah, I, yes, I, I am without, a primary the, resident. Yeah, without the amendments having been voted on, then if, if at the March meeting uh, changes happen to the amendments and we no longer have, I'm just giving an example, if we no longer have unhosted, then I'm not, I, I can't advise you on when or whether or not your property would meet the qualification until the, until the amendments are passed. So, so, so you're, you're possibly in March that we'd be able to start yeah. doing that, but yeah, not I, definitely. I, I, I can't advise you on how to how to manage that risk, so. Okay, well, that's an important thing to consider when people can start advertising for I, this I summer. I understand that, I, I think, um, yeah, I understand that. I, I wanna move on to other comment. Um, I think, I think it's- Okay, one more as question. A, as an operator, you have to take into consideration and, and weigh that risk on. Um, quickly, your other question, because there are more people waiting and, and I wanna get, they wanna get to those folks too. Okay. Um, Jeez, no, I'm forgetting it. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. If you think about it after the fact and want to email us, um, by all means, and I'm, I'm sure one of us can reply to you. Okay, we'll still be taken into consideration? Absolutely, yep. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your comments tonight. Um, next up in the queue is Deborah King. And just the second, Deborah. Good to go. Sorry for go the ahead. delay. No, that's okay. Screens. Go ahead, <laughs> Ms. King. There you go. Go ahead. We can hear you. Uh, uh, for some reason, I can't hear you. Can you hear me, though? Yes. We've got you loud and clear. Yep. You can hear me loud and clear. Interesting. Yes. I can't hear you. Well, as one who has been to every single meeting 
unless I've had an operation, which I've had two now since the beginning of this thing. That's how long these guys have been working hard. I, um, I really appreciate everything you've done. It is uh, one of the best things is the way you're trying to keep uh, folks from out of state just buying a property uh, to rent out on short term. Uh, having people um, have to prove that they are residents is a great idea. Uh, it seems like within the category of hosted, of course, there's a variety. I'm of the variety that would least have any problems. I rent out a uh, bedroom in my house. I live here. I greet them. I get to know them. They get to know me. Uh, and they do actually bring an advantage to our community uh, in that many of the people, actually a good percentage of the people who stay at my place have family uh, in the area and they get to stay at my place and not be underfoot in someone else's house. So that works out real well. And then the other thing is, of course, they, they support all the restaurants because we, they don't have cooking facilities here. And um, our places close by really do need a little extra help. So those are the things that I'm super thankful for. And I, I am a, um, a proponent of keeping uh, rules very simple so that they can be uh, enforced. My heart goes out to Richmond Terrace and Lawson Road. I wish that we could do something particularly to help those folks. Um, some of the people offering short-term rentals there are doing it in a very different way than I do or my neighbors actually in my neighborhood, which is very spread out. Uh, but anyway, my concern is limiting <laughs> our guests when we're in our kind of situation uh, to just one set of guests a week because people who come to a home where there's a family living there only want to come for a couple of days it's a different kind of vacation um, we don't believe me have cleaning crews coming in uh, I love to say my husband is sleeping with the cleaning lady uh, and uh, we have great fun with that one but the point is People are not coming in and out. We're not disturbing anyone. Uh, Jamie suggested that I go around to talk to my neighbors. I went to every single one. And my, frame, fav, my favorite comment was from an old timer who said, who do they think they are telling you what you're to do with your own property? Well, that is the old way of doing things. But the new way is to be very concerned about our impact on those around us. And I am concerned. But I don't think that limiting um, the few of us that are in this special group that rent just a room in our home should be limited like the others are. We are the safest of the group. Uh, and um, therefore, I think that um, the, the limit is going to really hurt us uh, because, you know, prime season wise, we're going to have people here for two or three days if we're lucky. Um, that's going to be kind of tough. And frankly, folks, not everyone in Cape Elizabeth is rich, as much as we want to believe that or keep that persona going. And um, some do need some help. And it's a very kind and gracious thing to do to think of the needs of others. Um, and I certainly am concerned about the, the needs of my neighbors and those who are listening who are short term uh, rental folks. Don't leave your places unsupervised. It's, it's not good for business, as you're seeing now, and it just is not wise or kind. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. King. Um, let's see, next up is Anne-Marie uh, Lizentke. Should be good, good to go, Ms. Lizentke. Man, I'm showing still muted. I don't know if it's her or on our end. It's a, yep, there we go. There we go. Okay. Go ahead. Anne Marie Ladizinski, 32 Richmond Terrace. I'm not going to beat a dead horse. You know how Richmond Terrace is feeling, most of the people there. Um, what I do want to say is I would recommend banding short term rentals in unhosted homes change those who have um, unhosted homes to long-term rentals. And now I'm, I'm hearing uh, about a 
an increase in the one bedroom apartments in the center of town. And so instead of making those one bedroom apartments, just make it into a hotel. It's in a, it's in a business district. And then we would have no issue with, there's no place in Cape Elizabeth for people to stay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next up in the queue is Steve Eppinger. And go ahead, Steve. Your Hello, name thank and you. Uh, yes, I'm at 13 Ocean Avenue. I've heard much of the discussion from both sides and the consideration of a compromise. And I just like to point out, you don't need to compromise. I mean, it sounds nice to compromise and, but you know, the other approach to dealing with a trade-off where, you know, both sides can't have their way is for you to decide which is more important. In this regard, I think your choice is quite clear, is the character of our residential neighborhoods more important than the commercial interests of a few. And that's a choice that you have. And sure, compromise sounds nice and you could consider that, but I actually think it's very clear which is more important. And that's your job to make that statement that this is more important, the, the character of our town and the nature of the residential neighborhoods is critically important to our enjoyment of this town. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is um, Jenny Aronson. Uh, just a second. Go ahead, Dr. Aronson. Hi, Jenny Aronson, 27 Lawson Road. I just want to say Lawson Road and Richmond Terrace do come up, but any neighborhood in this town could experience what we've experienced. It's not guaranteed it's just going to be limited to Lawson Road or Richmond Terrace. And I um, hope you will support the compromise. I just want to reiterate, it is a compromise. I feel like it's a big give. I wanted short-term rentals banned. And for the last 18 months, I've written all of my negative experiences on my street, um, but primary residency requirement, limiting it to 42 days, seven day intervals, I think the permit number should be on the advertisement. I just want to say something since this is for the general public. Strangers are strangers. You don't know who they are. Unruly strangers are not necessarily breaking are not unnecessarily breaking the law. The police don't want to be involved. It's a big negative. It destroys my peace of mind in my home. It destroys my summer day. I but there's nothing you can do about it. And nice strangers aren't that nice necessarily. I'm sure Jeffrey Epstein was very nice when he rented places. Weird people, we don't know these people's backgrounds, they're coming. We don't know who the cleaning team people are. We don't know who I see people coming in delivering food, asking me where this house is, you know, kind of really beat up cars. It's like, oh, or can I help you? Yeah, do you know where this number house is? We're bringing dinner. I really don't want a lot of people coming into my neighborhood. We can go through all of the terrible things that have happened to different children because of strange work people or strange people in neighborhoods. Get a clue. It's not safe. That's my final word. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Anne Marie Ledzinski, your hand is still raised. I, I'm not sure if you had something additional you wanted to add. You did not use the three minutes that you had, or did you just leave your hand up? Um, Matt was going to reopen your microphone here. Go ahead. No, I don't know how to undo it. So okay, it's it's down now. So thank well, I'm you down. <laughs> okay. Um, next up is a dial-in participant. Uh, I'm just going to read the phone number, last four digits of the phone number, rather, um, 4282. Uh, so uh, your line's going to be opened up in just a second here. And um, once it is, if you could give us your name and address, please. Might be muted on your own end, too, so you might have to unmute on your, there we go. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello? Oh, We hi. can hear you. Yes, um, my name is Peggy Kozlowski, and I live at Six Boathouse Lane. 
Um, and I would just like to say I've written um, several times about this issue. We have at least four houses in our little tiny neighborhood that are not primary residences um, and that are used for um, vacation rental from January 1st to December 31st. Um, children are unsupervised and I'm co constantly policing their kids. Um, they're climbing on rocks. They're doing very dangerous things that parents don't realize are dangerous. And, you know, they don't read the rules. They don't care about the rules. They're just there to have a good time. It's a very small enclosed community. Um, and so people feel that it's okay to let their kids run around unsupervised. And so th this is not even an issue of being a primary resident. Um, my neighborhood has become just people buying properties and renting them out. And it's very sad that it's come to this, but um, we really hope that that you guys consider to, um, if not totally ban short-term rentals or and even, you know, non-primary residences to uh, at least consider doing the 42 days. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, um, there are no uh, additional folks with their hands raised. Um, one just went up. So um, before we bring that person up, if there are other folks that uh, are intending to comment, if you could please uh, raise your hand and get into the queue, that would be helpful just to judge uh, how many more people we're gonna have. Um, see a couple of hands going up. So next up is Scott. Uh, Matt, I'll open up your mic in just a second, Scott. It's it's open now. Go ahead. I think I am unmuted. Yep. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Rockwell, 119 Old Ocean House Road. Uh, I, together with my wife, Lisa, have operated an in-home owner-occupied STR successfully for nearly eight years. We've hosted in excess of 300 individual groups during that period of time. Typically, these groups consist of a couple but can easily accommodate a family or a group of six people. On average, the length of stay in our uh, location is less than three days, 2.75 to be exact. But uh, we have been active uh, <coughs> and we have been active in this uh, ordinance process for over a year now and have found that our concerns have not been given the weight and consideration um, that we uh, certainly have heard from the opposition at the beginning of this, uh, of this particular session. <clears throat> the hosted stay category, which, we, which has been deemed a unique scenario, even in the whereas statement on this uh, agenda, we have provided numerous statements ourselves, letters and contributions uh, to support these unique differences. <clears throat> they cannot be broad brushed with the ordinance as written as it mostly pertains to the problems found in the unhosted, uh, yes, in the unhosted stay category. At the last workshop meeting, nearly all current council members were in agreement that this part of the proposed ordinance could be changed and still accomplish the goal of oversight and enforcement. That at least was the, the sense that we were getting during that particular discussion between us. Uh, before there was a Sally Dark Cloud comment that kind of put stifled that issue. But, uh, you know, at that meeting, um, <clears throat> the proposed ordinance was discussed uh, that it could not be, it, that it could be changed and accomplish that goal, um, accomplish the goal of oversight and enforcement. We have written and spoken about different scenarios and basically have been told that this hearing is the best way to discuss and accomplish the changes we seek in this proposed ruling. To be clear, as hosted uh, STR, uh, in-house hosted, uh, you know, on-premise hosted STR hosts, we seek to have the one rental per seven day period stricken as it pertains to hosted stays. <clears throat> there have been no incidences that have caused this concern short of some of the anecdotes that we have heard in the past that had no founding in, in uh, an actual uh, complaints that were filed. And it is micromanaging our 
lifestyle as well as our income opportunity from home where it is not necessary to do so. There was discussion that the contracted enforcement arm software could not screen for the differences between a hosted stay and a non-hosted stay, uh, which is one of the reasons that were discussed why this, this particular uh, seven day uh, portion could not be changed. Uh, it's simply not true and I've offered ways for this to be accomplished. As a secondary and very important concern, but uh, you know the, the actual entry cost for anyone trying to participate in this is extremely expensive for someone that just wants to try it out. $500 for someone that's willing to uh, offer their home for a hosted stay is, is a little bit too much. And it actually discourages um, or actually will cause those that are willing to skirt the regulation to try and be a scofflaw and uh, not participate in it uh, properly. So um, I got a little bit long on some of this and wish to just if, try and wrap it up with. If you could, Scott, that would be great. Page 1.5. Um, anyways, the, the ordinance clause that we seek to change is not considered in, our, uh, in other towns right nearby us. The restrictions would preclude any uh, real uh, viable participation in STR bookings by causing us to have to have only one booking per week. Uh, most folks, as has been stated earlier, just are looking for a couple of days. And, you know, in between uh, those times, we have uh, other opportunities that come to us for those that can't find a place elsewhere. So we're hoping that you'll be able to uh, consider our actions and follow through with some of the questions that we had asked for in, in previous uh, correspondences. And I look forward to any questions you may have uh, of us as we are very willing and able participants in this process and look forward to some good positive outcomes for, for the community in coming to a, uh, a conclusion to this. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Next up is 503 Ocean House Road. Um, Matt, I'll open your mic in a second. Go ahead. Hi, this is David and Kate Parisi at 503 Ocean House. We have a, um, a STR here, which is attached to our house. So obviously it's hosted. And we feel for the people on Lawson Terrace and Rich, or Lawson Road and Richmond Terrace, but they're all talking about unhosted properties, which should be heavily regulated or, or maybe eliminated. However, as a hosted property, we, we've, this is our third season. We've had no issues whatsoever with neighbors. Um, at this point, I believe all of our neighbors have written once or twice to the council saying that they fully support us. Um, some neighbors actually enjoy the interaction with our guests um, over, the, over the fence in the driveway. And just today, um, as a benefit to the community, we had a booking from a, uh, a couple who moved from Maine to the West Coast 10 years ago and now want to remove re remove back to or to move back to this area and appreciate the fact that we have a, a place where we can host them because there really isn't other than the STRs particularly the hosted STRs there's really no place to stay other than in by the sea to be right here which is as you know considerably more money and um, you have to interact with lots of staff and lots of other guests. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Um, are there any remaining people that would like to speak on this tonight? Uh, I see a hand raised for Craig. Sure. Go ahead, Craig. Yep. Yep. Good Go evening, uh, uh, Chairman Gavin, Councilors. 
uh, in speaking with uh, Matt Sturgis earlier today, I realized um, an email that I had uh, sent to him to forward to you uh, last week on Tuesday wound up in his spam file. Um, have, did, were you able to receive that email today? Yes. And the explanation of the typo on it. So I won't read that entire email to you again. Um, you all have heard from me many times over the last, uh, over almost, uh, well, well over a year now that you've been going through this. Uh, and I do thank you for your uh, diligence in, in doing so. So the, the main comment does concern is concerning, I'm ad addressed in that email is your consideration for existing contracts um, that even in 2019, the council at that time said that they would honor contracts that were already in place for the following summer, which would have been this past summer of 2020. But due to COVID-19, obviously, a lot of things have changed. Um, so now, some of us who have had permits, have do have permits, have always had permits, have contracts from people who could not stay with us in the summer of 2020 because of COVID-19. And it seems retroactive to should you enact these, which we again don't know for sure, but should you vote next month? to eliminate and, and adopt uh, the short-term rental as it is now and adopt your resolutions. And then enacted in the end of June, um, it's retroactively affecting people who have contracts. And my proposal is that when and if you change this, would you consider that at that time, no new contracts going forward for permitted people who already have them. We could easily prove that showing Ben what we have as far as contracts, at least allowing people to maintain the uh, deposits that they already have. I think this is probably probably only a few, but it certainly does affect financially people um, going forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, is there anybody else still wishing to speak on this uh, as part of our public hearing tonight? I see the hand raised of Sarah Lidzinski. Go it's, ahead, Sarah, uh, your microphone's open. Yep. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Ladizensky. I'm at 201 Delano Park. And this is a comment more about um, revenue to the town. So we are sort of establishing that this is a commercial enterprise in a residential business, in a residential section. If the short term rentals are to continue, Will there be some sort of like tax change where the the businesses pay a business tax plus the residential owner pays their regular property tax um, so that the town at least is recouping some additional monies to um, to pay for the use that these people are coming into the town and using you know the parks and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if, if this is something that's already been enacted or thought about or what the status is of, of that sort of situation. Um, I'll, I'll briefly say that uh, as with most businesses and towns, if there's, a, there's a, if there's a fee like there would be for this one associated with the operation of the business, then that's how the town uh, recognizes any revenue from that business activity. Short of that, uh, the, the major contribution to the town in terms of revenue is an assessed value uh, for the property where the business operates. There's no other, um, whether it be for short-term rentals or any other business, there's no other um, uh, tax or, or revenue stream that flows to the town beyond the uh, assessed value of the real estate. And what is the current fee cost? The proposed fee in the amendments here is uh, $500 annually. Okay. Uh, the current ordinance as it stands uh, prior to these amendments is $50. Okay. And based on the number of sort of suspected short-term rentals, do you have an idea of what that would, what sort of revenue that would generate for the town? 
The projection on the revenue is number one to uh, make cost neutral. Uh, the contracting with the third party vendor that we uh, have established um, services with to do the uh, monitoring and scanning of uh, online listings to know uh, who's operating and, and whether or not they're op operating in conformance with our regulations. Um, as part of this process, we've been going along and have been provided information from both code enforcement officer as well as a couple of very informed citizens who did a lot of data gathering for us that estimated that um, when you include hosted rentals and unhosted, um, there were as many as uh, upwards of 130 to 160 um, properties that um, were at least being advertised at one time or another as available for short-term rental. So 500 times 150, if you wanna average it. Thank you. Yep. Any other citizens wishing to make a comment on this as part of our public hearing? I see no hands. I'll wait a few seconds in case there's anybody. Seeing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing on this then. I wanna thank everybody uh, that offered comment, um, again, either tonight or uh, through email or your continued engagement in this um, process. Um, with that, I'm uh, gonna look for a motion um, uh, from anyone on the council to table this to our March 8th meeting. I'll make the motion, Jamie. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Deb, could you read the roll call, please, for the vote? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So again, we'll pick that up um, for an intended vote at our March 8th meeting. Um, a corresponding agenda item is uh, number 12 on our agenda, uh, a public hearing on the amendments to the comprehensive plan uh, recommendation number 88. Um, I'm guessing that most folks that wanted to talk about this probably made their comments as part of our last item. But if there's anybody from the public that wishes specifically to talk about the amendment uh, to the recommendation in the comprehensive plan. Uh, I welcome your comments at this time. So you, again, use the raise hand function. Not seeing any hands go up for this one. Obviously the two items are sort of hand to glove. So um, going once, going twice, we'll close the public hearing on that. Uh, similarly, is there any motion from a counselor to table this to the March 8th meeting? I'll make a motion. Counselor Boucher, is there a second? Second. Counselor, counselor Noonan, could you again read the roll call, Deb? Counselor Boucher? Yes. Counselor Devereaux? Yes. Counselor Gabrielson? Yes. Counselor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Counselor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next up on our agenda is another public hearing, this time on fence amendments. Um, it's item number 44-2021, planning board recommendation relating to fence amendments. Uh, the uh, recommended uh, amendments to chapter 19 of the zoning, zoning ordinance related to fence amendments. So uh, do we have any members of the public that would like to speak on this public hearing item? Not seeing any hands. Going once, going twice. Close the public hearing on that. Is there a motion from Councillor on adoption of the recommended amendments to Chapter 19 of the Zoning Ordinance related to Fence Amendment Section 19-1-3? Uh, 
definitions in section 19-7-12 are relating to fences and corner clearances. So moved. Moved. So moved. Moved by Councillor Gabrielson, seconded by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there any discussion from the council? I just note for the record, Jamie, we currently have 67 folks um, participating. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have a feeling there's something else folks are hanging around for. Um, any other discussion? Thank you to the planning board and the ordinance committee for your work on this. If there's no other discussion, Deborah, could you call the roll please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Uh, continuing our string of public hearings. The next one is on Town Farm District Parking Amendment. Um, this is item number 45-2021. Again, a recommendation from the Planning Board uh, relating to the Parking District, uh, Town Farm District Parking Amendment. This is to bring current practice over the town farm in conformance with our town ordinances, uh, a fairly uh, administrative task here, but we'll have the public hearing nonetheless, if there's anybody that would like to speak on it. I don't see any hands going up. So we will close the public hearing on that. Is there a motion from counselor to uh, adopt uh, the recommended amendments, this time pursuing to chapter 19 of the zoning ordinance uh, relating to the town farm district parking amendment section 19-6-10 in the town farm district. So moved. Moved so by moved. Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Second that. Seconded by Councillor Valerie Devereaux. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we will vote. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next up is item number 15 in the agenda, which is number 46-2021, a public hearing on the item of boards and committees amendment relating to the supervision of the bottle shed, which is located at the recycling center. The recommendation is for uh, administration of the funds generated from the uh, proceeds of the bottle center, bottle shed um, to be uh, the responsibility of the recycling committee. Is there anybody from the public that would wish, wish to speak on this public hearing? See no hands for this one going once, going twice. That public hearing is closed. Is there an amendment? Uh, is there a motion rather from uh, any councilor to accept the recommended amendments to the boards and committees section relating to the bottle shed? Motion to approve. Moved by former recycling committee member Councilor Boucher. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor mm -hmm. Noonan. Is there any discussion? I just wanna quickly thank um, the folks who had been responsible for this previously. It was sort of an ad hoc responsibility that fell on them. Um, and I don't want uh, this to be in any way seen as um, not appreciating the work and time and effort that they put in on that task. Um, former counselor, Chris Straw was the one who brought this up and I think it makes sense to bring it um, you know, functionally under the auspices of the recycling committee. Um, but I definitely want to thank um, the staff and uh, other volunteers uh, that had been previously responsible for this work uh, over the last few years. Um, with no other discussion uh, or comments, we'll call the roll, please, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Um, again, having already addressed number 16 in the agenda, we'll move on to number 17, which is a uh, item number 48-2021 to set a public hearing uh, for the traffic ordinance and parking amendments that were previously discussed at our most recent workshop uh, for both Kettle Cove at Crescent Beach and Seaview Avenue, Glen Avenue. Is there anybody um, from the public that just wants to comment on this issue? This is to refer this to a public uh, hearing which would be at our March 8th meeting. I see no hands going up for public comment. Is there a counselor that wishes to make a motion to refer this to a public hearing at our March 8th meeting? I will, Jamie. Thank um, you, Councilor I, Penny Jordan. Oh. I, I move that we uh, send this motion along for public hearing at our March 8th, 2021 uh, council meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Councilor Devereaux. Is there any discussion? I have a question uh, as part of discussion here. Um, what's the council's opinion on whether or not this is something that we will vote on at the March 8th meeting, or is it something that we want to have the public hearing and then um, potentially wait on voting? Or do we think that there's I, I'll just leave it there. What do we, what's the council's opinion? Go ahead, Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, I think that unless something um, uh, major comes up that we could uh, potentially vote at that meeting. Okay. I can't, I can't see uh, any major thing at this point in time, but I haven't heard the public hearing yet, but. Um, any other comment? Go uh, ahead, Councilor Gaberson. Yeah, I, I'd be fine to vote on this in March. I think if we decide to wait until to, to set the public hearing in March and then vote on it, it at our April meeting, I think we'd be okay. Uh, you know, I, I know the desire of the neighborhood is to kind of get this set in time to have signs, appropriate signage deployed before the season. Um, okay. I just wanna be able to set a clear expectation with the public either way. So I, I, I'm, I, I, think, I think there's enough time to do it either way. And I, I, it, I, I don't really have an opinion, strong opinion one way or the other. I just wanna be able to manage and set the expectation with the public. Council Devereaux, I saw your hand. Um, I, I agree. I think that um, what Councilor Jordan said, barring any um, difficulties, why not go ahead and vote on it and get this, this going? We've been talking about it for a long time, and I think the residents are ready to have this done. So, Okay. Any other discussion or comment on the item? Seeing none, we have a roll call again, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next item is 18 on our agenda, number 49-2021, the acceptance of the Village Green at Ocean House Commons. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item. This is merely accepting um, the uh, open space that was part of uh, the site plan and has been um, wrapped up and, and effectively finished. And so the council needs to formally accept this on behalf of the town. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Uh, is there any motion from council on the acceptance of Village Green at Ocean House Commons and the conditions that accompany that are outlined uh, in the agenda? Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may. Go ahead. I just had one point of clarification, if it, if sure. it would please the council. On point number five regarding uh, uh, easement rights for the installation of a new connection to the existing Ocean House Commons domestic water line, uh, we've had conversations with uh, the owner's representative, and there is some concern about uh, uh, about uh, the size of the water line that is going in there. If there may be capacity, 
they they may be open to it if it's proven that there is the ability for uh, that capacity in the future but with uh, uh they're not sure completely of the needs and the ability to provide as much water as you need uh, so the request would be to take that line out uh, we will we do have other options that we could explore in addition to that to install irrigation this spring as part of the or this <laughs> next summer as part of the uh, 20 uh, uh, fiscal year 22 budget but it's a uh, but that would be something that we'd like to strike at this time and continue working with the property owner if that's available to us they they've been uh, great about having that as an option it's just a question of making sure that they have enough capacity to serve the whole property which is a, a very reasonable uh, concern can you better help us understand the risk if there's not or or, or what the implication is if there's not if there isn't it, it would be uh for uh, uh for instance the next item on the agenda uh to make sure that there's enough water to supply that property if uh with the amount of units that are proposed that would go in on that property so uh they just need we would have to do some additional testing to make sure that it would satisfy uh the properties that were under you know before this became a concept would be served by the amount of water that could be provided by the by the existing infrastructure water line and if not, there'd have to be some other source to provide that if the proposal was to move through. Yeah, we'd look at tapping in at the hydrant or uh, or an additional line, perhaps from the from the town uh, town halls uh, water supply as well. It's just a question where we would make the connection. That would be the easiest one as currently constructed. But if that doesn't work, then uh, we'd want to we want to use the, one of the other options. For instance, this summer uh, when uh, the grass is being installed. Uh, LP Murray and Son had used a tap from the uh, from the hydrant to to water the grass on a consistent basis, but we we do believe we're going to have to install at least on the upper part where there's a it has a tendency to be, get dry. We want to put some, uh, or at least we have proposed to put irrigation in the 22 budget. Okay, what I, I guess what I'm trying to be direct about is whether it's the development that's part of the next agenda item or or anything else that if if different service needs to be provided is there any jeopardy to the village green itself which in, in terms of having to tear it up or something to to provide that service or something oh, like that no it's, it's currently in, that's all within the within the road uh like within the the right of way there for the road that comes through so uh we were just looking to do that before it got paved if it was available so uh, but okay. we, we'll know we'll know that fairly soon. But it's uh, it's it's they're they're uncomfortable with us, and we're after after meeting with them, uh, we're also uncomfortable with number five, uh, and we found it a very reasonable request. But they're, okay. they've been great to work with. Without objection, we'll strike five from um, the uh, from the enumerated list of conditions, um, and uh, so is there. Did we get a motion on that, Deb? Or am I still waiting for a motion? Yeah. So, is there a motion to uh, accept the village green uh, with conditions one, two, three, four, and six as outlined in the agenda? So moved. Moved by Councillor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Noonan. Any discussion? Seeing none. Councillor Boucher. Good. Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Next up is item 19 on the agenda, number 50-2021. Consideration of referring to the planning board amendments to the town center district as proposed with a new multifamily development. Matt, we do not have Maureen with us tonight. Is that correct? Or do we? I didn't, I haven't skipped Yes, we through. do, Mr. Chairman. I believe I've, I've seen her in there a few times. Yeah, okay, so, I... <laughs> so long list of people. I couldn't remember if I saw her there. Would you mind please promoting Maureen to a panelist, number one, and Maureen, once you're promoted to a panelist, if you could just give, um, before we go to public comment on this, just a brief explanation of the um, item specific to um, the amendments, not necessarily specific to the broader project and proposal, um, since all we're moving uh, 
potentially forward on tonight is referral of the amendments. So if you could just uh, give us a little bit of context for that. And thank you for joining. Sure. So um, you, you all saw the project proposal last week and in order for that project to move forward, there are some adjustments to the existing town center zoning that are requested. Um, it will be up to the planning board and ultimately the town council to decide whether those proposed amendments are consistent with the overall town center district and with the comprehensive plan. Um, the four amendments they're looking at are increasing the density. They have made a proposal to the council that that, indents, that density increase is absolutely fundamental to being able to qualify for the federal financing that makes it possible to build this affordable housing. Uh, they've also asked for a height increase and that looks like it's in the 42 feet from 35 feet. That allows them to create a fourth floor that is part of that whole idea of getting those minimum 49 units. Again, they, they've made the case that without 49 units as a minimum, they are not going to be able to take advantage of all the federal financing in order to be able to make this affordable project. Uh, the third item they need is a building footprint alteration. Right now, the town, um, the village, the town village space and bulk requirements. One of the ways we manage that is by creating these standards. We have multiple standards that regulate space and scale. Um, and one of them is requiring that a maximum building footprint be 5,000 square feet. We also allow multiple buildings on the same lot. They can be up to 5,000 feet each and they can be connected with, with a connector that really functions just as a connector. And this project has all of the functions of a connector, but it also is putting three building units in the connector section, again, to hit that 49 magic number. And because of that, they need a building uh, footprint alteration. And then finally, again, in order to fit 49 units into the three dimensional building envelope that's available to them, they're asking for the first floor, first floor mandatory commercial requirement to be eliminated in favor of putting a uh, first floor residential in there. So those are the four amendments that are being requested at this time. Thank you for, um, for that overview, Maureen. Sure. Um, the other thing I wanna just point out is that the amendments and the referral to the planning board, uh, cause I know we've received a fair bit of public comment um, over the last 36 hours or so on this are fairly narrowly tailored um, to uh, the permitting of affordable housing use. Um, I, I know I've certainly seen a, a number of folks who have raised concerns that this is opening the door wide open for massive development of all sorts, um, which uh, specifically this referral um, is, is very narrowly tailored to avoid just that. Um, so I just wanna clarify that for folks. And I am gonna get to public comment in just a minute. Um, like I said, we did receive um, quite a bit of communication uh, just in the last 36 hours or so, so much so that I certainly didn't have a chance to respond to people. I do want to thank folks for the time that they took to email into us um, and things like that. Um, one thing I want to draw folks attention to um, is the council did hold a workshop on this item, uh, basically receiving uh, what I would consider just a preview of the concept. Um, but that was just seven days ago uh, that we did that. And that was the first time it was brought before the council other than um, some counselors did take advantage of the opportunity to meet individually um, with the developers um, to uh, get, again, just get a, a preview look at, at what it was that they were um, considering bringing forward for consideration. Um, so this is not something that um, is anywhere further along at this point than the very first step in the process, which is referring it to the planning board for the planning board to then come back to the council uh, to advise us on um, what amendments would look like uh, were we to move forward in that direction and whether or not, as Maureen just said, whether or not those amendments would be considered consistent with basically the two um, plans uh, that, that are in play here, which is the plan that was developed about seven or eight years ago for, uh, or six or seven years ago for the uh, town center district, uh, as well as the most recent update and forwarding of those plans 
uh, as reflected in the comprehensive plan two years ago. Um, so the agenda item tonight is simply for the council to vote on whether to refer this item along to the planning board to come back with um, uh, uh, disposition on those specific amendments. We are, to be clear, we are not voting to approve the project. We are not voting to change the zoning or anything like that tonight. We are just uh, potentially voting um, to advance this along to the planning board for them to take a look at. So with that, uh, I will open it up to any of the other 63 uh, members of the public that are still dialed into this meeting. Um, this is not a public hearing, so the public comment period for this, uh, unless extended by the council, is intended to be 15 minutes with a three-minute limit per person. So if you are interested in speaking, I ask that you please raise your hand using the uh, raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be recognized and called on. And then, like I said, if you could keep your remarks to about three minutes, and if we uh, exceed uh, the number of speakers within that 15 minute time, the council can then decide whether or not to extend or continue the public comment period. Lastly, before anybody lines up in the public comment, I should mention that because this is an initial and first step in this, there will be multiple uh, exhaustive opportunities for public comment, whether it be at planning board meetings, which are open to the public, whether it be at future town council meetings, which always have the opportunity for public comment, or whether it be through continued email communication or other written communication to the council um, to be considered uh, as part of the record. So uh, whether you speak on this tonight or whether you choose to do so at another time, I encourage you to follow along. Um, and I really encourage folks to go back and watch the video of last week's workshop that I referenced because it has um, in about an hour's time of presentation, I think a good amount of information, whether you're for or against this, it, it's uh, not consequential. Uh, but I think you'll find that the the our presentation last week was very helpful in terms of answering or at least addressing a number of the points and concerns uh, uh, that that I've seen raised in both emails and in other sources uh, in the last uh, day and a half or so. Anyway, that's my tangent over. Um, so I see the hand of Jen Pollock raised, and when Matt opens up your mic, uh, we'll uh, welcome your comments. Go ahead, mic's open. Good evening, I, I just wanted to state openly that I don't understand why when, why we would even consider it, it can, it can end here, I'm assuming, because it, nothing from what I saw in the presentation, I watched your link, nothing that was agreed upon is met by the developers, not a single point. It's, it's nice to say it's a variance, but the fact is they can't fulfill the uh, building development that this town agreed upon at any point, not footprint, not commercial development, nothing. It's, it, it makes no sense to me why we would even consider it. So I, I just think this needs to, to die here. Um, I really have nothing else to say about it. I, I, it's just baffling to me. So I'll leave it back to you. Can we get your name and address, please? It's Timothy Pollock, 46 Broad Cove Road. Thank you. Are there other folks from the public that wish to speak? John Baldwin, I see your hand raised. Uh, just a second, John. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yep, go ahead. Uh, I just recently found out about this, and I agree with Timothy in that it uh, it just doesn't meet any requirement, uh, nor does it uh, really in, enhance the, the town, and, and more importantly, the town center, which is really a, a center for everyone in the community. And it so I mean, it, not that low-income housing is not important in any community. It's just, I mean, it, we set up zoning laws to protect the entire town, and uh, this just doesn't even come close. So I mean, that's my initial thoughts on it. John, can we get your address for the record? Uh, One Peppergrass Road. Great, thank you. 
Um, next in the queue is Rosemary Townsend. Just a second, Rosemary. Go ahead. Oh, might be muted on your end, Rosemary. Unmute. Can you Go hear ahead. me now? Loud and clear. Uh, Rosemary, Go ahead. Rosemary Townsend, Seven Field Stone Road. Um, I just learned about this today, so I'm uninformed, but my immediate question is, how does a one bedroom apartment meet the needs of low income families? Uh, are you going to limit the number of people in the apartment or are you going to allow 10 people in a one bedroom apartment? Um, I'm not gonna speak for the developers other than to say that um, your suggestion that it would be simply that only people that have families would be potential tenants. I think uh, disregards a vast um, swath of the of the potential population that might have interest in this. But otherwise, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to speak for the developers on that. So um, there there was discussion about the one bedrooms that was part of the uh, meeting, which is available online. If you want to go back and watch um, from that from last week. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, Tim Thompson's hand is the next one raised. Just a second, Tim. Good to go. go ahead. Your mic's open, Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me? Loud and clear, Tim. Go ahead. Uh, it's been, uh, I've been kind of waiting for this one item, although I've been watching all night long. I appreciate all the work you guys all do for us in our town. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, I want to speak in, in, in favor of this uh, being referred to the planning board. Uh, and I'm not necessarily in favor of the project or not in favor of the project, but I am in favor of, from our work on the comprehensive plan, I do know how difficult the, the whole topic of affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth is. I think Penny and, and Maureen would both vouch for that. It's, if, if nothing else, if this gets the, uh, the conversation, this project maybe doesn't make it through the, the whole test that the planning board and Maureen will certainly put it through their their, their uh, the, the tests, uh, we do need to have that conversation because affordable housing in town is a real challenge and uh, finding a spot for that. Um, we, we talked a lot of, about it in our, in our meetings and it's just not an easy, it's just not an easy uh, problem to find a solution to. So I'm in favor of it, uh, uh, getting, getting some additional conversation in town and, and maybe we can come up with a, uh, a solution that'll eventually work and provide some affordable housing in, in, in Cape Elizabeth. The one I, the one thought I had about these one bedrooms is, uh, I do know there are a number of older people that want to stay in town, that don't. They're stay. They're, they're many of my friends are staying in their homes. They're not giving up their homes because they don't have an alternative in town. And some of these, uh, some of these apartments, maybe maybe that solution for them, moving into something they could stay in town and 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 then give up their residence that would be available for a younger family to move into town. So thanks for your time and all that you guys do for our town. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, next is again, uh, Dr. Meyerowitz. Go ahead, Zev, just a second. And, uh, Matt, I'll open your mic up again. Go ahead, Zev. Hi, everyone. Again, Chair Garman, members of the town council. Uh, it's been a long night already, isn't it? Um, so, uh, I'm not going to comment on the merits of the building. Um, I, I, I do agree with the, the prior speaker that, you know, I think we need to have the affordable housing conversation, um, in town, um, as probably the, I, I don't recall another individual that has managed to develop a mixed use building in the town center zone, um, in any recent memory, certainly in the last five to 10 years, um, I had to do it not once in 2017, but twice as with the second one that I had to go through in the last year. Um, and I, I really, I, I have to express that I'm, I'm quite disappointed um, that the fact that we're, we're even having the conversation of a building that is asking for four individual variances is even being had. Um, the amount of pushback and the amount of um, uh, hoops that I had to go through as an individual who not just lives in the community, but practices in the community and creates jobs in the community, um, had to go through to simply, you know, enrich the town that I live in um, for something that met every single ordinance of the zone, 
compared to even having the conversation of a of a project that is potentially obstructing up to four different ordinances of, of the zone. Um, I think we're gonna, you know, I, that wouldn't, that would be something I, I wouldn't be able to sit well with. Um, and so I'm not against this particular project, but I'm certainly against it as it stands right now. Uh, and I, I do think that ordinances exist for a reason. And if the town chooses to change those ordinances looking forward for particular reasons, that might be a different conversation. But I certainly received no such treatment as I went forward with any of my projects. In fact, um, I, I received significant pushback from the planning board on this exact same topic. And uh, I, I think where I would have to watch this one very closely, um, and I, I would regretfully probably, I'd have to, I'd have to present some opposition to it. Um, as it currently stands. Zed, before you drop off, can I ask you a quick question? Please. You, um, I, I wasn't, I didn't track or follow, you know, the ins and outs of your um, multiple developments very closely, but you went to the planning board, I think, t several times asking for variances or asking for changes to amendments or asking for um, relief from some of the some of the zoning right that that went through the process of the zoning uh, of the uh, planning board considering those and i'm imagining even possibly appeals on your part to the zoning board of appeals right may, may i uh, can i rebuttal please yep yeah so any anything that is in regards to my developments in dealing with variances or setbacks we we would have to deal with easements and parking or or, or not parking i'm sorry stormwater drainage or um, particular like nuances of the building because of shared use. Yeah. But I, I don't I, need to I, get into the particulars of it. I, what I'm trying to establish is that it went through the process of the planning board considering and reviewing. And then uh, if you were seeking re further relief going to the ZBA, in other words, the council didn't say, no, you can't do this, correct? No, and again, I'm, I think I, pre yeah. I predicated my statement by saying I'm yeah. not necessarily opposed to this, this development. That's not, yeah. and it's a purview of it. But there are some firm rules that I was informed specifically by the town um, planner not to encroach on. Um, and those were building height, building footprint, density, you know, and all the things that I, I see the, the current okay. applicant applying for. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Um, next up uh, with a hand raise is John Bolts. Uh, just a second, John. Sorry, John, I muted you just as you were coming off. If you, if you, uh, yep. there we you go. Know. Thank, thank you. Sorry for that, Thank John. You. Go ahead, John. I uh, just briefly a uh, uh, commentary. I'm speaking to support sending this to the planning board. I think it's um, the big risk we have now that the village green area has broken ground is that it is not built out. Um, and the other risk we have in town is that we will not build affordable housing of any kind. Um, again, this project is at an early stage. I think, it, as you said, uh, I think a, a preview. And there's a lot of going to be, I think, give and take as this goes forward. Um, and um, I think I'd like to remind uh, folks when the counselor spoke at the meeting that Jamie had, the, the workshop that Jamie had talked about, this was the kind of project that the, the people were hoping about when they were talking about building a, a vibrant uh, town center. Um, and if that kind of thing requires changes to the zoning ordinances, well, then that's something that really ought to be looked at. Because when you look at a vibrant town center, it comes with things like more density, like more challenging uh, parking, because those are the things that you find in vibrant town centers. If that's what you want, that's what you, goes with it. And so um, I would encourage you to refer to the planning board this particular project, and even perhaps further than that, with a um, look at, if this was the type of thing you had in mind, with a look at, are there changes that you need to really support a vibrant town center that changes that need to be made to the town center ordinance, or at least be able to be clear that the ordinances that are there will allow people to commercially develop a vibrant town center. Thank you, John. Um, Sarah uh, Ludzinski again has her hand raised. Go ahead, Sarah. Just Hi there. Yep. Um, yep. yep. 
Uh, so, uh, just in um, hearing what the last person said, um, I agree that the development of a town center and a vibrant town center is very important for Cape Elizabeth. But it sounds like the way that this um, zoning amendment is being processed is they want to get rid of first floor commercial uh, use in these buildings. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of just takes away the reason or part of the reason why you want to build it. The other thing I have a question of, is this like a 55 and older building? Because there, like you said, it's only one bedroom apartments, which pretty much to me prohibits any families from utilizing the um, apartments. So as we understood it in our workshop last week regarding the 55 plus, that that was um, something that's in the current draft of the purchase and sale agreement between the property owner and the developer for these two lots, but that is something that they're continuing to discuss and um, is not is not final. Um, I, I think if you go back and watch the workshop from last week, multiple people on the council expressed uh, a hope and desire that if something like this was to move forward, that that wouldn't um, exist as a clause and there would be no age restriction, but um, it's, it's not a component of the council or the planning board for that matter, but rather um, a current clause in the purchase and sale agreement between um, the private property owner and the prospective developer. Okay, thank you. Yep. Are there other members of the public that wish to speak on this? We have a few minutes left. Uh, there's a hand raised for Schinberg Consulting. Just a second while Matt opens your microphone. Go yes. ahead. Your name and address, please. Hi, Greg Schinberg. I am the owner's rep for Dr. Jacobson on the uh, town green. And I have been working with the Zanton company um, on the purchase and sale of the lot. And I wanted to just address the last question that was raised about the 55 and over. And I can say with some pretty good confidence that we have come to an agreement to have some flexibility on the age restrictions to open it up to um, the other age groups. And we should be able to work that out, uh, Chair. Okay, thank you for updating us with that information. Are there other members of the public that would like to comment on this? I don't see any hands going up. Okay. Um, Thank you all for your input and for your comments. And again, for all the folks that emailed us, um, is there any motion from any counselor uh, on the agenda item? I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Counselor Penny Jordan. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I move that um, we refer this to the planning board. Um, we refer to the Planning Board Development of Town Center Affordable Housing Amendments. The amendments should preserve town center requirements to the extent feasible, while also permitting an affordable housing project that provides a substantial public benefit. Recommended amendments should be returned to the Town Council by April 30th, 2021. In addition, staff is directed to develop uh, TIF district and shared parking proposals to be completed by May 1st, 2021 for town council consideration. Motion by Councilor Penny Jordan is our second. Seconded by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there any discussion? Councilor Devereaux? Um, I, I feel like we're jumping the gun on this. We just had our first um, workshop last week. The public has not heard anything about this. And now it feels to me like we're looking at spot zoning, which um, is completely unethical. 
we've have we have rules in place, our zoning ordinance in place, our comprehensive plan was just put into place two years ago. None of this was talked about as something our town wanted with this type of density, with um, these height restrictions, with no retail. Why are we sending this to, I just don't understand why we're sending it off to the planning board when we haven't even had a public hearing or input. I think that um, we need to step back and listen to what people in town want and really look at the impact studies. I know that impact studies were done previously when there was another developer who came in who wanted to build according to the zoning requirements. So um, I feel like it's um, moving too fast and that we need to um, slow down. Thank you, Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Um, I know I wasn't able to make it to the workshop, but when I listened to their presentation, don't they have a deadline? Like they need to have an answer before they miss like a deposit deadline that's like this month? Or am I wrong in that? Can somebody fill me in? So the developer, um, you're correct, has, as, as it was represented to us, um, a deposit and earnest money that's uh, already invested into the project. The, the reason that they came forward at the time that they did um, was for them to get a sense of the overall appetite for the project and be able to manage their risk on, on their investment. Um, so the information that was presented to the council gave them whatever confidence or not that they needed on whether or not to keep that earnest money at risk or not. And so they want to move forward, I guess, is my question to the Maureen maybe and whoever's been talking with them. I mean, are we just wasting our own time? Are we going to send this to the planning board and it's going to get be dead in the water because nobody in town seems to be supporting it at this point? And I mean, I, I just don't want to do more work and then them withdraw their whole plan in two weeks because they're not getting the support that they thought to keep their earnest money deposit in play. So before Maureen, you answer, I just, I just want to correct Caitlin that at the workshop last week of, of the public comment that was received at that workshop, it was almost unanimously in favor of it. So to, I, okay. I, I just, I just don't want to, I don't want to have anybody listening tonight hear a statement like everybody in town's against it and take that as fact when it, I don't, I don't think that's, uh, facts that are in evidence yeah. here, but I was going off of I did read all the emails that we got yeah. in the last <laughs> what like couple I'm, hours. I just, I just or don't so. want to make I don't right. want to make gross assertions either way. But nope. Maureen, did you want to respond yeah. about timing or process further to Caitlin's question? Sure, sure. And so the yes, the developer has a deadline, and they are going to have to proceed at their own risk and at the workshop, they were hoping to get a, a good sense of where the town was on it. And, but they're still, they're still have to, they're gonna have to decide to proceed at their own risk and on whether, because what they're proposing doesn't meet our current zoning. Uh, but I, I do wanna make sure it's clear that, you know, the zoning ordinance is supposed to be a document that evolves with the way the town evolves. And, you know, there are many, many towns that don't even have a building, for example, a building footprint, a maximum building footprint requirement. Cape Elizabeth has it because it was chosen as an excellent way to regulate the scale of a building. Um, and then an analysis was done of the buildings in town and the number 5,000 square feet was picked as the maximum. That doesn't mean 5,000 is a magic number. That is the only number that can ever be used. And the developer is not talking about not having a building footprint maximum. Uh, there's really a discussion about making an adjustment for this project because it, ha it offers a unique and substantial public benefit. And you can make that same discussion with the height requirement. There's really no magic to 35 feet. Um, you could, there was a time where people wanted the town center um, height to be no more than 25 feet. Uh, that was pushed back. It's still 35. Uh, 45 may, may still be fine. 
there are many, many uh, design standards in the town center zoning that the developer has no, no intention of requesting any relief whatsoever from and is fully expecting to meet all of those requirements. There are dimensional requirements, there are, there are openings and windows requirements, there are minimum so, uh, slope of roof requirements, and none of those requirements has the developer requested any relief from. So it does look like a big list when you look at it all by itself, but when you think about the whole process, it's not really that big if the council wants to move forward. And the reason you would send this to the planning board is the planning board could actually craft something that is in black and white that would allow you an opportunity to focus your discussion and decide how you wanna move forward. And you know, the board could write something that's very broad or they could write something that's very targeted. Uh, the history of Cape Elizabeth when they're looking at ordinances is you tend to be pretty targeted. Uh, you tend to crack the door open a little bit. And, and I, I will point out that the Village Green Amendment that got you the Village Green that you just accepted in the last item was from an amendment to the zoning that was adopted in 2016. So it's a fairly, fairly recent amendment and you did amend the zoning in the town center. And in that amendment, you, you remove the requirement for maximum building setback because you balance the potential benefit with what you were changing. And I think that's what you're gonna have to do with this project. And having a black and white draft, I, I hope it will help you with that discussion and that decision. Um, Penny, I'm gonna to come to you and then over to Jeremy. Okay. Um, I wanted to kind of um, uh, bring up from some of what uh, Maureen is saying, because um, when I think about this and I think about the title of uh, the Town Center Affordable Housing Development, um, so when we send this to the planning board, and this is why I made the motion, we're going to craft and look at the standards that exist today, and we're going to craft what those, um, uh, how those standards need to change in a very narrow way so it doesn't open it up to everything and everybody that would want to do development in the town center. And when I look at the work that we did on the comprehensive plan and the work that we did to, uh, to say that we need to have um, to diversify our housing uh, in Cape Elizabeth, and when I think about the statement made that uh, this is only one project and one project will not solve all the problems. When I hear what people are saying about they want public transportation in town, you're not gonna get public transportation until you have density of population. I think John Boltz is right on the money. He is right on the mark. In order to have a vibrant town center, you need to have mass and you do not build businesses and think people will come you bring people and then businesses will develop that that's how it happens you're not going to have businesses go to a town center that doesn't have any people coming to them uh, the other thing is, is that from a historical perspective there are many people who are enjoying neighborhoods such as Cross Hill that took almost 10 years to put into place. The number of modifications that need to be made in order to do cluster housing was not an easy lift. Um, and it happened. And we put the development in place and people are enjoying their houses and the neighborhood, etc. So change is gonna happen. And we can sit here and we can say, no, not the right project, not the right project. But I have to tell you that uh, if we're moving away from uh, just 55 and over, I, I know that I have people who work for me that would love a one bedroom apartment in Cape Elizabeth. I also know that I'm of that age group that would love a one bedroom apartment in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and so I think that we need to, our job is to think about the future and to make some of the tough decisions. And that's why I made that motion because I think we need to hear from the planning board and have some discreet um, 
um, statements about what is it that we're talking about? What is it that we are potentially um, uh, giving up or changing in order to have this happen? And until you have the data, you can't make the decision. So that's why I believe we need to send it to the planning board. Thank you, Penny. Jeremy, you were up next. Yeah, um, thank you, Chairman Garman. Um, I I agree with Penny and 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 John and, and Maureen. Many of the points that have been made. Um, so I don't want to drone on too long. But I, uh, one of the points that I would like to address that was raised is you know sort of this question of why we're considering a, amending our zoning based on this one proposal. Um, and I'm, I'm in favor of sending this to the planning board, um, really, because I, I feel like this is a useful, aside from the merits of the project, it's a, it's a useful stress test for us um, to address um, Councillor Devereaux's uh, comment or uh, question about, you know, what this, what this serves and why we would be considering this in light of our recent strategic plan. I would argue that the other piece that came through pretty loudly in our strategic plan um, and in our continuing conversations is a need for us as a council to address affordable housing. And um, it may be that our current zoning is, for the town center is sufficient to meet that need. But I think this is a useful stress test for us to look at that and say, you know, given the scale at which these projects need to be developed in order to qualify for a federal affordable housing tax credits um, or just simply the fact that, you know, to take the density piece that many folks have raised, the fact that when you're building an envelope, the more units you can put inside it, the lower you're going to, you know, the more you're going to reduce your unit cost for, for development and make it affordable to develop the affordable housing that we need. I think those are all useful things to for the planning board to consider as we try and think about how we might need to not just for this proposal, but more broadly amend our town center zoning in order to accommodate the types of affordable housing solutions that we've talked about and prioritized as a council. Other comments? I just wanna say that making it clear that sent, I want to send things to the planning board for their review so they can review the data so they can understand what those requirements are like Jeremy just said and how we fit into those requirements and how we don't because one of our goals is to look at affordable housing as a town and if we're going to look at that we need to know what stipulations exist in order to create affordable housing in the town so whether this project gets approved or not which isn't what's being voted on then it all depends on what we need to do what's the data what does it support um, a lot of people have brought up questions about our one bedrooms in demand. We don't know. That's the process that this will go through if we send it through. So it, it's a question of looking at our ordinances and seeing if they support our goal of um, diverse housing more to me than this individual project. Other comments? Go ahead, Councilor Newman. Thank you. Um, I think what I'm hearing, but I just want to confirm, is that if we sent this to the planning board, what we would expect to get back is their thoughts on what these amendments would need to look like in order to make this work. Is that, yes, I'm seeing nodding. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that that's what we would expect in this process. Okay, thank you. Or, and Maureen, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, it's, it's entirely possible that they would come back and say, well, you know, after our assessment and evaluation, we think that these would work and are not too inconsistent with current zoning or town center plan or comprehensive plan, et cetera. But maybe, you know, one, two, and three do, but four doesn't. And so, mm -hmm. you know, back to you town council to figure out what to do about that um, or, none of them do or half of them, you know, I mean, any, you know, I mean, not, not unlike short term rentals, uh, you know, the planning board will come back, they'll give us their um, assessment and opinion and draft of language and then comes back to us to figure out what to do with that. So Great. That's um, helpful. thank you. Other comments or questions? Um, I just want to weigh in for a second. Um, and I, I see that um, you still 
uh, tuned in. So Dr. Myrowitz, I, I wasn't trying to be confrontational with you and I hope you didn't take it that way. I don't, I don't think you did, but just to be clear, what I was trying to point out um, in my question was um, simply that uh, the town council through a function of our workshop last week, you know, basically had a, a, an advanced look, sneak peek at this potential um, development proposal. Um, and, um, you know, we're about seven days ahead of anybody else. I, I've heard a number of different comments that, oh, I've just learned about this and, and so on and so forth. Well, we're not really that far ahead of you as far as that's concerned um, and, 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 and getting all the details and, and getting exposed to it. Um, but the, the point I was make, trying to make with Dr. Marowitz was that, um, you know, most development proposals like this, the only thing that's really different in this case is that we had that sort of sneak preview look at it. In most cases, something like this or other developments like Dr. Zevs that I was trying to highlight as an example, would go through the planning, planning board process and either through that process surface objections or obstacles or approvals or, or whatever the case may be, and maybe come to the council after the fact to say, you know, hey, this is, this is what I'm seeking here and, and the planning board needs to consider whether or not to, to review or revise zoning amendments in order to accommodate this. And the council would then at that point potentially make a referral to the planning board to do just that. The only thing that's in my view very different in this case is that we've already seen the development proposal, the, the request for um, considered amendments have already been outlined and enumerated and and that's just brings us to what stage we are in the process here. Otherwise, I, I frankly don't see how this is any different than any other development project that either does or does not have components of it that don't conform to current zoning. Um, it's just that we're asking the planning board to consider this now, as opposed to potentially what would have been later in the process had we not seen that. So um, I, I said for emphasis at the beginning of this that um, simply asking the planning board to um, uh, consider and draft amendment language is in no ways any approval of the project. And, and I wanna reemphasize that again now. Um, there are a lot of things that I think are interesting and encouraging about this project. I'll say that, I said that last week at the workshop. I also have you know, specific components of it that um, you know, raise, raise uh, concerns for me that uh, I, you know, if, if I were having to vote on that would would want to see addressed. So, um, you know, that's that's where I stand on it. And I think the planning board exists, uh, as somebody uh, earlier comment there said they they are the land use, um, you know, experts uh, as far as advisory boards to the town council. So I will look to them uh, and that expertise uh, to advise us on this matter. And when they come back to us, take that advisement under consideration. Uh, on whether or not it makes sense to approve amendments to the zoning in order to accommodate this development. So um, that's my stance on it. And um, if there are no other comments or um, discussion, uh, I'll look to call the question. Councilor Boucher. Valerie, did you have, oh. I'm sorry, Valerie, did I see your hand go up or? No, no. Okay, sorry, you're, 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 frame activated. I thought I thought your hand had gone up. Sorry. Okay, sorry, Deb, go ahead. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thanks. Um, I did before we move off of the topic. I did want to just say I did um, see the hand of Nathan Zanton go up in the in the queue of attendees, and um, having already closed the public comment period, and particularly given your position as the developer, Nathan, while I'm sure you had you know information that would have been valuable to the discussion, I I I wasn't comfortable you know breaking with our rules and process um, to then sort of go back, particularly like I said, with your stake and position in the in the process um, for speaking outside of the public comment period. So if there was something specific you wanted to add, uh, the council would welcome um, you reaching out by email uh, like anybody else, but I just wanted to give an explanation for having seen your hand go up, but not, not um, inviting your comment. 
Go ahead, Councilor Devereaux. I just want to say that um, my vote on this is in no way a, a yes on the project. I just think that it'll be important to get back, hear what the planning board has to say, but I think that um, this is gonna take a lot of input from um, residents. And I want everyone to know that I read all of your emails. We received a lot of emails um, against the project so that Mr. Stanton knows that there were a lot more emails against it than for the project, um, just so that he knows um, kind of where residents stand who have already contacted us. Okay. Our next agenda item then is number 20 on the agenda, item number 51-2021, uh, the fiscal 2022 budget preliminary parameters. Um, before we move to that, technically I've got 10.01 on my clock. And by council rules, uh, we need a vote of the council to continue with the agenda uh, to take up new business after 10 o'clock. So is there a motion? Move that we continue with the agenda. Motion by Councillor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Boucher. Any discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call for that, please, Deb? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, so back to item 51-2021. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on the preliminary budget parameters? Uh, it's the recommendation of the manager that um, uh, or the update rather from the manager that budget requests have been received from the department heads. Proposed municipal budget will be delivered to the town council by March 5th and then the town council will um, have an opportunity um, through our meeting workshop meetings in um, in uh, March um, to review and weigh in on that. So is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak? Seeing none. Um, Matt, do we have a specific action to take or just acknowledge this and move on? Uh, just a quick update, if I could, Mr. if I may, Mr. Sure. Chairman. Uh, a, a few things that we do anticipate for the upcoming budget will be, uh, we anticipate with, you know, hopefully with the pandemic waning and vaccines coming on board that we will see Fort Williams Park revenues that are expected to increase, specific to parking that we didn't see last year. As recall, we lost May and June of last year from parking revenue as the fort was shut uh, was shut down to outside visitors, at least with automobiles. Uh, so we are looking at that as well as uh, optimistically looking at an increase in uh, uh, bus traffic and trolley traffic that uh, was non-existent in this past year as well. Uh, so that's a positive. We are looking at building permits to most likely moderate from the from the torrid pace that they have been on this past year. Uh, getting back to more anticipated normal levels or our traditional levels. And then uh, revenue sharing uh, based on the governor's early early uh, budget, we are looking at that to increase. We were conservative on our estimate from that in the prior year's budget. Uh, we expect that to rebound this year, uh, although we are tracking where we need to be for this year, if not a bit above that. Operationally, we are looking at our budgets to be conservative. Uh, I just want to let the council know that. Uh, we generally get do that anyways as a practice, as, as you may uh, recall as well. Uh, so operationally, we do not have a great number of new initiatives that are out there. We have uh, we are in the process of doing some reconfigurations in some departments that we may find some savings in uh, over the long haul. Uh, nothing catastrophic or, uh, or uh, paradigm shifting, just some uh, opportunities from the most recent pandemic and lessons that we have learned from that. Capital projects are the big ticket that we do have this year in the budget. As you recall last year, that was the area of the municipal budget that took a significant change uh, in, uh, downward. Uh, unfortunately, many of those needs did not uh, go away. They just went out a year. So uh, you'll see some of those come back onto this year's uh, capital side of the budget. Uh, we do have uh, two large hard assets that are proposed. Uh, and that would be a, a loader at Public Works and then a replacement of Engine 2 uh, with the fire department. And uh, but we will be looking at lease purchasing approaches with that. But uh, uh, the, uh, 
but I just wanted the council to understand uh, that as well as uh, if, if you had any thoughts as any direction you would like, like us to go in uh, where we come from that point, or if you'd like us to maintain we, uh, our normal course and speed and try to come in with a maximum benefit to the, to the town with a minimal impact on the tax rate. Thank you, Matt. Um, anybody want to weigh in? Um, you know, Matt, I, yeah, I mean, I think like, like we've done the last few years, I mean, you're, you're well in tune and have a good, you know, finger on the pulse of what's going on in the community and, um, the type of feedback that, you know, we typically receive, um, as it relates to the budget. Um, uh, I think my, my guess is that the rest of the council would like to continue in that fashion. Uh, review what comes back and then have the hard discussions around what may or may not to be, you know, just like we did last year, um, even under the extraordinary circumstances that we went through that last year, um, just have the hard discussions at that point, whether or not we need to, you know, further balance um, priorities and, and needs and so on and so forth. So um, as we've come to understand as well that, you know, this is a collaborative process as it relates to the total budget number, uh, through the work that's ongoing with the school board. And so I think, you know, absent of seeing anything, you know, come from that um, direction concretely yet either, that that's, you know, only only half of the puzzle um, in terms of assessing um, sort of total impact to the Cape taxpayer, so. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on effectively. And uh, I just appreciate hearing, hearing where the council is. And I just wanted to do that, be up to speed as to what preliminarily we've been looking at. So thank you for that. It's good to hear that it sounds like there's some positive things working in our favor, so. Um, if there's no other uh, discussion on that, we'll move on to item 21 uh, on the agenda, which is number 52-2021, uh, 2021 Town Council Goals. Is there anybody from the public that would like to uh, offer comment on this item? John, I see your hand up again. So we'll go to you in a second. John Volts. Go ahead, John. I just wanted to uh, follow up from a, uh, after my comments from the workshop to just say, I actually really appreciate the new way the town council goals are laid out in a way that is strategic. Um, uh, uh, I hope that you will continue to use this format going forward. And if the comment also that as you um, sort of gotten near discussing, um, as you look at some of these, thinking about what consists of a baseline of where you are at uh, and giving some consideration to putting some words to the baseline so you know what you're measuring against and doing it now. Because if you're going to check back in periodically, as you mentioned at the workshop, establishing in writing what the baseline is right now uh, gives you something to measure against. And not all of them may have a baseline, but many of them will. So I would encourage you to do that. And then that also allows you to, to link it more tightly with your budgeting process going forward. Thank you. I appreciate the effort. Thank you, John. I know Councilor Boucher appreciates those comments and very grateful for all the work that she's put in um, on this new format and presentation, which I think uh, is of tremendous benefit to both the council as a working document, but also to members of the public to better understand and comprehend um, the goals that we're setting forth. So um, appreciate your feedback on that. Um, the other thing I'll say, um, it was uh, a extended discussion point as we were wrapping our workshop on this agenda item last week, um, but goes to the point that you just raised, John, um, which was, uh, while maybe not going so far as including in the actual document some of the baseline measurement that you were just talking about, um, we did have substantial discussion around um, operationalizing these goals in a way that they don't become just something that we vote on uh, at a meeting here in February and then don't really um, refer back to in any way uh, throughout the remainder of the working year. So uh, one thing specifically we talked about was having them basically as part of the budget um, binder and, and packet and, and review process so that we were 
looking at things that are laid out as goals that have specific financial um, and resource commitments to them and understand exactly what those are and, and what will um, be required to accomplish them. And then um, establishing further sort of touch points later in the year, um, probably mid-year and, and then towards the end of the year, just to evaluate um, you know, how we're tracking against the goals. Matt does a very good job with the staff um, in using the goals as sort of a blueprint for um, you know, laying out work plans and things like that um, and, and directing and guiding their efforts. Um, but uh, the council agreed that it would be beneficial to, to get more engaged in referring back to them at multiple points during the year um, just to see how we're actually doing against what we said we were going to. So, so I just thought I'd share that with everybody. Uh, is there other public comment on the goals? I uh, don't see any hands up at the moment. Okay, uh, seeing no other hands raised. Um, Nicole, is there anything you wanted to add at this point? Or um, if not, I just we'll just realized open it that up there is a there's a sticky note left on the <laughs> on the draft I sent over. So if we did vote tonight, we should vote to remove the sticky note before we <laughs> <laughs> good housekeeping measure, sure. And I um, did um, update the one town concept with the one that Matt sent over. Thank you. Um, do other counselors have points of discussion they want to raise or motions to make? Penny, go ahead. Um, I'm going to go back to my question from the uh, work well, when we discussed these. I I don't know why I have this need to walk through them and make sure we all understand what they are. It's like, and I agree with you, Jamie, they sh should be part of our, our budget our document and all of that. But there are ones in there that I just would like to understand the thinking behind them. Um, because you're, I, I, I don't want to vote on something that I don't necessarily understand. Which ones would you like to talk about? Oh, did you want to do that tonight? <laughs> Well, or if, if, if there's substantial discussion remaining, it, we, we talked about this last week, if, if we need to um, table this and, and come back to it, that's, uh, well, I'm it, fine to yeah. do that, but. Yeah, here's a, it, it's like, um, nobody asked me why I wanted to put something on there that says don't trash Cape as I see all the trash on the sides of the street. And how do we address that issue? Um, and um, which also gets into all of the dog stuff around town that just blows me away. Uh, the historical part, I would love to hear a deeper thinking uh, because Valerie keeps bringing this up and I go, okay, what are you trying to get at? What are you trying to get at? Um, and I want to understand what she's trying to get at uh, because I go, oh, okay, there could be, there's something inside there. When we talk about, and we're gonna throw this out, paper streets, you know, what are we gonna do there? What are we talking about? Are we talking about resolving it? Are we talking about just keeping the talk, keep talking about it? Um, when we talk about um, pesticide ordinance, we had that, we've been doing some work on that. Uh, where does that fall in the whole kind of priority, uh, priority list? Um, uh, let's see. I'm talking about how we leverage the, um, the, the coalition that Jeremy's part of to ensure that we are uh, really participating in solving um, regional problems around housing and hunger and all of those things. It's like, I don't know why I have this high need to have a conversation about these that we all understand them from the same depth and perspective because how we aren't necessarily going to go deep on all of these, but which ones we're going deep on and which ones are going to just kind of cruise across the top. It's, it's kind of a mind meld of sorts. Okay. Other people have thoughts? Valerie? Um, 
I hear what Penny's saying, and it sounds like we need to send this back to another workshop and spend just a little, at least a little bit of time um, going into some of the specifics so that they're really clear because it looks like um, some of them just aren't clear, clear enough. Jeremy? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Or, or if they are, I mean, they may be clear enough, but I, I think we would benefit from, as Penny is saying, just kind of walking through it and making sure that we share a common understanding of what, what they mean. I don't, I don't see anything in here that I, I disagree with, but I do think that sending this back to a workshop, um, just for kind of, I, I feel like we have gotten to a point where, you know, I like the form that we're in. I like the, the, the direction that it's going. Um, but I think it would be useful to go through the document sort of from, from head to tail um, and, and have some conversations to make sure that we're, we have a common understanding of the elements that are in there. Uh, Council Noonan? Yep. Um, I just want to say that I would agree, and I just want to acknowledge that normally I would balk at um, spending, you know, waiting through April to approve a year's worth of goals, but I just want to acknowledge that probably three quarters of the work that we did was more around the format, and so um, now it's maybe time to spend a little more time delving into the goals themselves, and then next year, um, most of this work that we just did is already done for us, so I, I just want to acknowledge that I don't think we would expect it to take this long year after year, but it just part of the process of revising the format, so. Um, yeah, and I, I was going to make a point, and you just alluded to, I, I'm not opposed to having a brief workshop focused solely on it. I know our March workshops are specifically dedicated to the budget uh, for the most part, and they occur after our next um, meeting on the 8th. Uh, I'm not at all opposed to scheduling a, you know, a relatively brief meeting uh, between now and the 8th um, where we can just put this to bed. Particularly, I, I think it would be important to do that um, and then vote on it at the 8th so that we have the agreed upon goals to accompany that budget session that I just spoke to about being an important thing to, to have as a companion item as we go through that work. So, um, so we can you know, we can look for a date between now and the 8th, um, you know, when we're done talking about this, uh, if, if that's the direction we're headed. So um, it sounds like, it, it sounds like folks want to have a little bit more discussion. That's totally fine. I, I encourage everybody to come to that discussion uh, with action in mind and uh, less, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. less discussion, more action, I guess. Is what I would say. So we can, we can get to uh, get to the finish line here. So, um, so with that, um, before we look for a motion to table this um, to the March eighth meeting, um, could I ask that everybody take a peek at their calendars to see um, what might work for a workshop? Mr. Chairman, if it would be helpful at all, uh, February twenty second uh, and uh, March first are both. Uh, currently vacant spots on the calendar, if that's helpful to the council. How's Monday the 22nd for folks at this point? Head nods all around? <laughs> great. 7 o'clock on the 20th would be great. 22nd. Uh, I'm sorry, the 22nd, yeah. OK, with that, is there a motion to table this item to the March 8th meeting? I move we table to... meeting. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan, second by Councillor Boucher. Yeah. Uh, the vote on that, please, Deb. Councillor Boucher? Yes. yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Alrighty, um, so that concludes our uh, regular agenda. If there's anyone still from the public here that wishes to speak about something that was not on tonight's agenda, now would be your chance to do so. Uh, 
I don't see any hands going up. So absent that, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion by Jeremy. Is there a second? I'll take Caitlin's yawn as a second. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I know that was a jam-packed agenda, but appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, is uh, Can we do one more vote, Deb? Yes. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. And it carries. Thank you very much. I'll have a good night. Good night.